From craziest saves to unbelievable bands, here are the things you didn't know about football. Low headers. We all love headers. The more in a match, the better. We even love fish dives. And low headers are a game at its finest. But wait, low headers are banned? What? Yes, hear about the most vague ban in football from me. While passing the ball with the head is generally accepted, attempting to pass the ball on the ground with the head what the hell? is deemed illegal and is actually frowned upon because of the dangers it poses to the players. In the heat of the game, it's possible to get a severe kick on the head from a player coming in for the football, so I do get the point, but wait, flicking the ball up at the leg before heading it is also illegal? Now that confuses many people. Even the professional football players like Verratti and Perisic, as they've been booked for different variations of low headers in 2019. Donkey kick free kick. Done notably in 1970, this kick was an instant hit. Getting the title of the world's best free kick from the fans and a band from FIFA, it was executed to perfection by Ernie Hunt back in 1970 when Coventry City beat Everton FC 3-1 in an English league. This free kick shows the creative prowess of a player, which involves him using a donkey kick to elevate the ball for a teammate to strike towards the goal. It's ingenious, and I personally love this trick, but the football authorities deem it inappropriate for official matches. When Kevin Nolan attempted the donkey kick from a dead ball situation, the move was disallowed as it had been banned years ago which means we won't be witnessing such an impressive goal in the future. Do you know what else we won't be witnessing? The shirt catch. Now, I don't believe any player would like to hold the ball inside their shirt, look like a pregnant woman on the ground. Still, no one is allowed to do it because of the ban on shirt catch, not without getting booked. You might have seen some street players doing this trick, and it does look great, but FIFA considers the shirts of the players as an extension of their arm, making it a foul to trap the ball inside the shirt. Any manipulation of the ball in this manner is treated as a violation, akin to handling the ball intentionally, which means an unavoidable booking. Ask Norwegian right back Jan Gunnar Soli. He was once booked for doing the shirt catch during a game. Throw in goal. Have you guys ever wondered why the players throw the ball back in the game instead of kicking it when it goes out of play? Well, because authorities needed to balance out the advantages given to both teams, a kick-in would be the equivalent to a free kick, which would be unfair to the opposing team. Nonetheless, the throw-ins are important. A good strategic, long throw-in can really change the game, and that's why some players have even mastered the skill of the long throw. But of what use? A direct goal just wouldn't count. According to the game's rules, a goal cannot be scored from a direct throw-in. If the ball enters the opponent's goal, then a goal kick is given. Neymar's penalty trick. Now this one is interesting. Whenever a match goes to penalty kicks, the game becomes intense. Thousands of eyes, one penalty taker, one penalty saver, one ball, immense pressure. And during such heated moments, Neymar came up with a trick to exploit the goalies back in 2009 and destroyed an entire league with it. No one noticed it at first, but when he scored five penalties in a row, some curious minds saw the ingenuity in the trick. They took it up to FIFA, who keenly observed Neymar doing the trick and then banned it worldwide in 2010. They said the trick was unfair to the goalies, who are usually in the spotlight during penalties, and exploiting them for that pressure by doing this is unsportsmanlike. Fair enough? Well, I think so. Emiliano Martinez's Mind Games don't think Neymar is the only player to cause a rule change. Make some space for Emiliano Martinez, whose moves and mind games during penalty shootouts led to a rule change. So what happened was, during the World Cup quarterfinal in 2022, when the game went to penalties, Emiliano Martinez brought in his taunt skills against the Netherlands. Now, goalies are known to distract the penalty takers, but Martinez took it to the next level, and his moves really helped Argentina not only bag that victory, but won against France too, winning the World Cup. And well, this time, FIFA has had enough and stepped in by bringing up a new law. Stop it prohibiting goalkeepers from distracting penalty takers by taunting, delaying penalties, or by touching posts and net, effective from July 1st of the year. Handball goal. Now, come on, it's called football for a reason. The ban makes total sense, but the story behind the ban is worth listening to. 
So the year's 1986. It's the World Cup quarterfinals, Argentina versus England. The game was going to be tough. Everybody knew it. Argentina's captain Maradano, too. He was ready to do whatever it took to win the game, and by chance, it took a handball goal to win the match. To the dismay of England, the referee was so far from the action, he couldn't spot the handball of Maradona and gave a goal. Argentina went on to win not only the quarterfinals, but took the World Cup home, too. <laughs> and, well, well, the handball came into public view. You can only imagine what happened. The controversy and criticism was unmatched. Referees were doubled, handball was banned, but the anger of England fans was not cooling down, and rightly so, I think. Untouchable move. Ronaldinho is unmatchable when it comes to dribbling moves. I mean, man got his talent up his nose, and his untouchable move is truly a masterpiece. Only FIFA watched it with raised eyebrows, and then went to ban it. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine the frustration of Ronaldinho and all of his fans of his crazy skills. But wait, guys, we don't want serious injuries on the ground, do we? Yes, attempting untouchable during heated games can result in someone coming after the ball on the player's head, and in an attempt to do so, can whack the player's head off. So FIFA banned the Ronaldinho's untouchable move, terming it as a showboating move and will result in guaranteed fouls and yellow cards for the player attempting it. Rainbow Flick Neymar is a league apart when it comes to attempting impressive football tricks, and, well, another league apart when it comes to getting his tricks banned as well. The latest addition in the long list is Rainbow Flick. The Brazilian legend was playing in a league game versus Montpelier in 2020 when he did this. The crowd went crazy with excitement, and everyone was enjoying the game except for the ref. He deemed Neymar's rainbow flick as an act of showboating, resulting in a yellow card for provocation. Neymar was taken aback and immediately went to his captain, Marco Verratti, to complain and explain the whole situation, but the ref wasn't changing his mind. Next stall. During the unveiling of the players at new clubs or warm-up matches, you must have seen players showcasing their football handling skills by doing this impressive feat, the next stall. The trick involves a player controlling the football by kicking it up in the air and trapping it with the back of their necks. Not an easy thing to do, I must add. But as much as we would like to see our favorite players practice, they cannot attempt it beyond warm-ups and non-competitive settings. And, well, the ban makes sense as opponents are always after the football and one resting on the back of a player's neck might endanger the player. Running knee locks. Yes, as impressive as this skill may look, Running with the ball trapped between the knees is considered equivalent to handling the ball, and I mean, out of all the banned tricks, this one looks the most unattractive, so players really should avoid doing this in my opinion. And even if they do it in professional football matches, the a little bit ugly and a little bit risky running knee lock comes with a yellow card. And you know what else can get you a yellow card? Seal dribble. Just like next stalls, seal dribble is another incredible football feat in which a player juggles the ball on their forehead while running, showcasing his incredible technical proficiency in the game. But this trick is also limited to players unveiling, warm-ups, and friendly matches. Though not explicitly illegal, players are not encouraged to attempt this trick during official professional football matches. It's considered unsporting behavior, and involves a healthy risk of players getting booked up by the match officials, reason being the perceived risk of injury associated with such showboating, and we unfortunately have a real-life example of Kurlan Mora Souza, whose career is said to have greatly been affected by the injuries resulting from excessive seal dribbling. Headstall Look at this majestic headstall by none other than CR7. It's a shame we cannot see him do it during the matches, not without the chance of it getting booked by the referee. Though not as easy to execute as it looks, you will mostly watch players executing it to the perfection in warm-ups, unveilings, or friendly matches. In official matches, though, this trick is strictly prohibited, as it's regarded as unsportsmanlike and may result in a yellow card. Back Pass Rule Hands down to the band with the most exciting and interesting backstory. You may or may not know that during a match, if a player passes the ball back to the goalkeeper in his own box, it's considered a foul. But it wasn't always like that. In the absence of this rule, a novice team not only frustrated the big names of the football world, but also went on to win the title. So, the year's 1992. 
Yugoslavia dropped out of the Euro Cup and was replaced by Denmark despite not being able to qualify for the tournament. The team who was not even supposed to play and was picked up as a replacement ended up beating everyone by this simple trick. After they won the title, FIFA changed the rules of the game and refused goalies from picking up a deliberate back pass. Now, all of these bans were crazy, but making three saves in three seconds is even crazier. Wonder no more. And let's watch it here in the craziest saves in football history. Opening up with this crazy Colombian keeper who thought a scorpion kick might be a cool way to stop a goal. And he actually did it. Red Nat. Goodness me, have you ever seen anything like that in your life? Of course, Rene Higuita thought of doing it with a style, but that save just secured him a number 13 on our list. Next on is poor Mo Salah, whose goal was completely ruined by a player who wasn't even the goalkeeper. So Salah was about to score one of the biggest goals of his career in the Manchester City vs Liverpool match. But this dude right here decided to make everything about himself. That too, by making an incredible save. It was simply crazy. But if you think saving the ball once was a big deal, how about saving the ball twice? Here, while I'm still trying to process the speed, agility, and reflexes of this dude, he's managed to save the net not once, but twice. Maybe he learned reflexes from our next goalie, because without him, Argentina might have never won the 2022 World Cup. Big matches mean more pressure, more drama, and more stakes in the game, and there can never be a bigger match than a World Cup final. With millions of eyes on you, it's every second, every move, and every save that counts. And the 2022 World Cup final had everything. From a majestic hat trick from Kylian Mbappe to incredible defenses. But none of it could have won Argentina its trophy if it was not for this one save. Everyone will remember Emiliano Martinez for this iconic save where he denied Randall Colomuani. His performance was right on point. Just like this goalie making three impressive saves despite being injured. Look at this. The man is hurt and in pain, but he's not giving up. He's still in the game and makes the first save. Looks easy to you? Okay, wait for the second save. Ooh, that's a good one. But it was the third save where he denied an incredible header that made all the difference. The game ended, his pain worsened, but the man delivered. Eloy room for you guys. But hey, stop, wait a minute. If three saves in a match is a big thing, how about three saves in three seconds? Wait, what? One, two, and three. Three saves in three seconds. Jan Oblak was on fire against Bayern Leverkusen. And still, this play is nothing to the one save that became one of the most viral YouTube videos in football history. So, Barcelona and Sevilla, the two powerhouses, were in for a thrilling football match. Garcinho and Messi dazzled the crowd, scoring two goals and putting their team ahead 2-0. But the real hero of the night wasn't on the offensive line. It was the goalkeeper, Ter Stegen, defying gravity. He leapt an incredible 1.8 meters into the air to block a shot, a feat that instantly became one of the most talked about moments in football history. That was no ordinary play, and this dude became a viral hit. A snapshot of this iconic save became a viral YouTube thumbnail, racking up over 70 million views. But the craziness didn't stop there. It was just one of the four spectacular saves he made that day, leaving the fans in awe. But our next player left the whole world in awe when he broke a Guinness World Record with his performance. Tim Howard made history during the 2014 World Cup. He's the guy who said a Guinness World Record was all over Twitter with a whopping 1.8 million mentions and gave this interview 
Watch for yourself. It's great to have Team USA superstar goalie Tim Howard with us this morning from Brazil. Tim, I got to say, uh, first, congratulations on a heroic performance last uh, night. You almost single-handedly broke Twitter. 1.8 million Twitter mentions of you alone. And I want to ask you, have you seen what is out there about you today? You are the new face of the quarter. You are Mount Rushmore, appropriately named Mount Howard. And apparently you have been promoted to Secretary of Defense overnight per Wikipedia. Did you see any of this? <laughs> I, I, have not, I only just woke up, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> I've not seen any of that, but that's, uh, that's, quite, fu that's quite funny. <laughs> well, and, and it's well earned. You made 16 saves against Belgium, and that is uh, the best by a keeper in a world match since 1966 when they started keeping world records. You were awarded man of the match. How do you feel about your performance yesterday? Well, I, I've said it all along. That's what I signed up to do, you know, stick my face in front of balls and get in the way, and that's my job. So um, I was able to do a lot of that last night. And, you know, for me, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't enough, but um, we nearly did it, and, and I couldn't be prouder of this team. Now, you might be thinking, what's so crazy about him? Well, let me tell you, it's pretty mind-blowing. This man has the most saves in a World Cup match. And that's a world record, thanks to his masterful performance in 2014 during a match between Belgium and the USA. This dude pulled off an impressive 16 saves in a single match. No goalkeeper has ever emerged with those numbers since 1966. The USA goalkeeper put on a show-stopping performance that nearly broke the internet. His heroics came in a match against Belgium, where he made those jaw-dropping 16 saves. And guess what? He was named the man of the match. Now that's a record to be proud of, but imagine, this couldn't even make our top three picks. And this happens to be when your guardian angel works extra time for you. Lucky, right? Nah, that's more than just getting lucky. Just like our next goalie, who outperformed Ronaldo in a game. Hands down, one of the most 2004, and the highlight of this whole match was not Ronaldo. But this man, yeah, this gloveless man, is Portugal's goalie. The match went into penalties after a 2-2 draw. And guess what? He saved the goal without gloves on. Ronaldo has taken off his gloves for this penalty. And Duras himself denied! Yep, he did that. Ricardo taking his gloves off, saving the penalty, and afterwards scoring a goal from the spot to eliminate England from the tournament was simply epic. So, all the saves up to here were good. Now, it's time for our top three craziest saves. And at number three comes a save that became one of the most iconic goalie performances in football history, in which the goalkeeper saved the net from two of the most iconic football players. So the tournament was Euro 2020, and the match was Portugal versus France. Ronaldo kicking things off with a bang, scoring a brilliant goal. But Benzema wasn't in there to watch and let him steal all the spotlight. Again, looking for the run, he's bound Benzema. What about that? He came back strong, hitting the net, not once, but twice. With Portugal trailing 2-1, Ronaldo knew it was time to step up his game. He equalized the game. But defusing the attacks of players like Pogba and Griezmann was no easy feat, and Ronaldo knew he couldn't do it alone. And this is when our hero made his entry. Well, I mean, he was already on the field, but you know. Rui Patricio, the goalkeeper for Portugal, first denied Pogba, and right after it, when it looked like an easy goal for Griezmann, Rui said, nah, and denied him too. He saved the net from two football legends. Many called it the save of the tournament, but even better than this save was this save. Okay, I'm not sure what to do. He's out of position now. It's a clear run. Giggs has got Rooney up to his left, two defenders back, and Hart has got there, but Rooney has gone for it. 
wasn't it simply incredible? Coming in at number two is Joe Hart's insane save that earned him the prestigious Premier League Golden Gloves Award on his 300th appearance for Manchester City. Joe, would you like to take a step forward? Ladies and gentlemen, on his 300th appearance for Manchester City, Joe Hart has broken a record for Premier League Golden Gloves. Congratulations, Joe. But let's talk about the save that really stole the show. It was during a match against their arch rivals, Manchester United. In one tense moment, Giggs with the ball, got Rooney on his left, he set his teammate for what seemed like a sure goal, giving him a clear shot. Rooney went for it, but wait, out of nowhere, Joe Hart sprang into action with an incredible 80-yard sprint to deny Rooney the goal. This was crazy. The man ran like Usain Bolt to make that save. But even this couldn't compete with our number one pick. Remember the name of Gordon Banks, a legendary goalkeeper in football history who's crowned by many to have made the best save in football history. But to watch that legendary save, I'll have to take you all back in time. So, the year was 1970, and it was the FIFA World Cup match in Mexico between England and Brazil. Pele, one of the greatest footballers ever, took a powerful header that looked like it was going straight into the net. But Banks said, no, not so easy, mate. This dude saved the net with just his fingertips. It looked like something out of a movie, but it actually happened on the football field. Many, many football legends called it the save of the century. I think the save that Gordon Banks made against Pele was the best save I've ever seen. You think this was an impossible save? How about a team winning 149 to nil in a football match? Well, let's see how that became possible in 15 things you didn't know about football. Let's start off with this one furious football match. During the second round of the Parnaense League's meeting in Brazil, players from both teams went wild. This was the moment of explosion when both teams knotted up into a brawl on the field with their hands and feet. After receiving four yellow cards, they resume the game, given that in two minutes, each team will showcase their footwork. But since the players couldn't control their anger, the chief referee showed eight red cards, five to one team and three to the opposite team. That's almost eight red cards in two minutes. But not every match ends up with explosive brawls. Sometimes it's the beautiful goals that keep us stuck to the screens. Whoa, what a goal. Again, this is not always the case because not every player can make such long distance kicks. But have you heard of MSL, who apparently made football even more fun by adding a two point rule? It's similar to the three point arc in basketball, a more practical approach to aim ridiculously high goals. Now, players can make incredibly action packed goals while keeping the buzz alive. On that note, behold, for the greatest strike of all time, and the fastest goal in the history of football, it took Nawaf Alabed two seconds to set this unbreakable goal. Nawaf is a 21-year-old striker for Saudi Arabian football club Al-Halal. On November 9, 2009, in the Prince Faisal bin Fahad Cup match, Nawaf did something unbelievable. This match was against Nawaf's team and al Shawala where Nawaf blew the net just two seconds after the opposing whistle. But do you know who else can blow off the match opening? The Grizzly Bear. FC Mashuk KMV Piatigorsk versus FC Angusht Nazran got a twist of fate when a bear was invited to rock the pitch off. The footage shows this giant grizzly bear standing on its hind legs and clapping in the air to kickstart the Russian football league. And while this looks all cute and fun, PETA labeled it inhumane stating the use of circus animals is against animal rights. But who cares? It's Russia escorting the team's winning traffic with a bear. But you know, not everything fun can happen on the football field. Speaking of which, players are not supposed to celebrate their joy with an illegal celebration. In 2019, football lawmakers ruled that whoever takes their jersey off to celebrate a goal will get a yellow card. Worst case scenario, he'll be suspended for the next game if he does this again during the same match. And cherry on top, your next goal will not even count. Well, they had to do all this to avoid unnecessary delay. 
Now, of course, you gotta bag that win. So these Argentina dudes decided to pull off another savvy move to drag out and get on an opponent's nerves. And it's called the time wasting. Though it seems like quite a needless skill, it has worked wonders for some, including Mbappe, who is guilty of killing the game through time wasting. But enough is enough. Any player who's spotted acing this skill will immediately be booked, even if he's the GOAT. This means you'll be out of the race to get your hands on this million dollar trophy. That's right, 15 inches tall with a whopping weight of 13 pounds. This trophy is the ultimate goal of every footballer. Made out of solid golden rare minerals, this was created by the late Italian artist Silvio Gazzaniga. Surprisingly, it's not only the most expensive one in the history of football, but in all other sports games too. Depicting two golden humans holding a globe, this is valued at $20 million. But it's not the gold, it's the glory of victory and joy. Speaking of joy, it seems like Martinez has some smooth moves on the field, thanks to his extraordinary taunting skills that helped Argentina win the World Cup, even in the penalty shootout win against France. But I guess this time, they have to come up with something new, because FIFA, on July 1st, 2023, announced another rule called the penalty kick. It says the goalkeeper will no longer be able to unfairly district the kicker. They must remain on the goal line, facing the kicker without touching the goalpost and the net until the ball is kicked. Well, let's just say these players are not killing on the field, but know how to keep the fans hyped with some mad skills. So Ronaldinho stands in a league of his own when it comes to dribbling. Untouchable, unreachable, and unstoppable. After inventing a couple of incredible skills, dude came up with this until FIFA decided to put a ban on it. According to them, this crazy skill can endanger the players and their opponents. Imagine rolling the ball overhead and someone intentionally or unintentionally trying to whack the player's head off. Hence, they labeled it showboating, along with a yellow card penalty. But even after all these rules shutting down sneaky tricks and crazy skills, do you know the highest score ever achieved by a team in football is 149 to nil? On the 31st of October, 2002, a football match between Antonin Enrivo and Madagascar turned the tables by holding the world record for highest scoreline. Turns out, So Yamern lost the game purposely against their arch enemy, AS Adima, due to an argument over refereeing. And since they felt betrayed by their title, Ratsa Razaka's players kept kicking rapid fire goals for 90 minutes. Crazy, right? But wait, there's more. Let's talk about another scoring sensation. Introducing you to the most expensive footballer of all time, Neymar, a 31-year-old footballer with the highest transfer fee of $241 million. The dude signed a five-year mega deal with PSG, Paris Saint-Germain, as he left Barcelona, which the French club paid in full before joining in August 2017. Now, from Neymar's record-breaking deal, to another game changer in the history of the football world. This is Stadium 974, the only FIFA stadium structure designed to be fully dismantled and repurposed after the World Cup. It's the only transportable stadium in Doha, Qatar. It was built along a port side with more than 40,000 seats made from recycled shipping containers in steel. This allows building sustainability for relocating infrastructure to other countries too. Also, do you know the stadium is named after Qatar's international dialing code and the number of containers used to build it? That said, the football world is getting quite innovative and superstitious too. Well, I'm referring to number nine. Did you know a curse is associated with football? It's called the number nine curse. From Alan Shear to Ronaldo, Gabriel Batistuta to Robert Lewandowski, for the past 30 years at Chelsea, whichever player gets to wear jersey number nine is doomed. Romelu Lukaku chose the number nine after acing some of the best seasons of his life. But since it was cursed, his success graphs immediately went into nil with the same season. Now, when Alba Bayern decided to ditch number nine, his fans went crazy, and even Chelsea's own manager warned him of the curse. But Alba Bayern tended to think otherwise and wore number nine for his national team just so he could break the curse. And since we're talking about the unique experiences of players, have you heard of Lionel Messi's extraordinary cleats? Apart from the fact that Lionel Messi wears Adidas, of course, but it's not your ordinary one. The cleat has a computer chip inside to keep track of Messi's training. 
Things like how much ground he's covered on the football pitch and how fast he's moving. The thought behind this incredible idea is to help you get better at things you're already better than others. It's pretty amazing, right? But more amazing is that Messi has covered around eight and a half kilometers in a single match, including his jogs, runs, and sprints. God, these footballers by default run with the speed of a tiger. But what if I tell you there's a footballer whose career took an unexpected twist with the same speed? Meet Charlie Morgan, a Swansea ball boy whose journey of rolling in millions happened quite unexpectedly. I'm talking about this play. That's inexcusable. Well, the Whoa. Players, I think it's all because this little champ has gotten his bump bitten on the spot. And it went so viral that it not only helped Charlie gain 100,000 followers overnight, but he also managed to leverage this to promote his vodka brand, which surprisingly became the fastest growing drink in the entire UK. The brand, called Al Vodka, with its elite look and colorful flavors, ultimately led to Charlie's net worth of $48 million. Sometimes you make some wins, but other times, oops, you hit a snag. One awkward rule called no own goal states that players cannot score their goal from a free kick or a throw-in. Not only that, but they can't even kick their own goal directly when the match restarts for whatever reason. However, the goal will count if you throw the ball into your net, leading it to cross the goal line without anyone touching it. Look at this next clip. Hades goalkeeper, Josui Duvergy was playing against Canada in a CONCACAF World Cup when he made one of the worst errors ever. The poor dude somehow managed to kick a goal. That was a grave mistake on his part. Now, you never thought you'd see Messi cheating his way to win, but I have him with many other football legend caught cheating. Now, you didn't imagine Messi here, did you? In 2007, when Lionel Messi was still a young footballer playing for Barcelona, they were up against city rivals Espanyol. Both teams were really trying hard to win. Espanyol's defense was strong, making it hard for Barcelona to score. And this is when Messi decided to take things into his own hands. Literally. When the game was almost over, he did something truly out of blue. Yes, he used his hand to touch the ball and scored a goal. Everyone was shocked. Messi's move helped Barcelona win the game, but you know what else is shocking? Watching CR7 put cheaters in their place. So here's a Seville player trying to make a shortcut to the victory by damaging the penalty spot surface right in front of CR7. As if that dude was just gonna let you do that. Come on. Unfaced by the chaos, Ronaldo takes the penalty and there goes the ball into the net, and this is how you win games. But what if your back is against the wall? Well, cheat your way out. Something on these lines can be said about Sergio Ramos, who, in the high-stakes Champions League final of 2018, did something no one could expect from him. His Real Madrid team was up against Liverpool, led by the talented Mohamed Salah, but Ramos was in for a win. He wanted nothing else out of this match, even if it meant manhandling someone. That move left many shocked, and Mohamed Salah injured and in tears. The guy really seemed to be trying to rip Salah's arm off his body. That was an ill move that had Salah being escorted off the field. Ramos's Madrid went on to win 3-1, but that day, Ramos lost Salah's respect for good as the Egyptian footballer has never been able to shake the bitter memories of that night. But in that, in one moment, like, disappeared, it's, it's so, so difficult, it's so difficult. But that's nothing compared to what we have coming next on our list. So, you guys, I never thought I would see someone so cheating and then lying on the ground, having a hearty laugh about it. But then we have David Luiz. The dude is all up for cheeky tricks on the pitch, and in one tense match between Chelsea and Manchester United, with Chelsea up 1-0, David Luiz decided to get the job done by hook or by crook. Well, in this case, by flop and flip. That was just start with. Just kicks him after the ball is gone, right in front of. The man not only made a brazen move right in front of the referee, he also laughed it off. And this wasn't even his biggest cheating move. The dude, when meets Zlatan Ibrahimovic, becomes a force no one can stop. Look here, the pair thought of creating their own rules on the pitch, 
and even did so by making their own free kick line. What the hell? I guess they didn't like the placement of it. Zero Fs given to the presence of the match officials. You know who else didn't care at all about the match officials and plotted something truly evil? Hang tight, this is going to be intense. Back in 1989, Chile national team was facing off Brazil and their World Cup hopes hinged on this crucial match against Brazil. If Chile lost, their dreams of qualifying for the World Cup would be shattered. It was one of those matches that required all of your work, wit, and, well, wickedness. Robert Rojas was the goalkeeper for Chile, and during that time, Brazil was leading 1-0. Chaos erupted. Fans saw Rojas lying on the ground, crazily bleeding, seemingly injured by a flare thrown by Brazilian supporters. The situation got so bad that both teams left the pitch, and Chile refused to play the game at all. However, a day later, a shocking revelation came to light. Television footage revealed that the flare had not even hit Rojas. Doctors also admitted that Rojas' injuries didn't match those typically caused by a flare. So what was that? It looked as if everybody knew the truth, but no one was willing to say it out loud. Yes, it was a trick played by Rojas and the Chilean team. Rojas had a razor blade in his goalkeeper's gloves and used it to cut himself, faking the attack. Their goal was to get Brazil disqualified from the World Cup, but their plan backfired spectacularly and Rojas received a lifetime ban from football. Crazy, right? We have a lot more crazy things coming up, so... Back in 2010, Luis Suarez was a Uruguayan football sensation, but he was also one of these people who used to wake up and decide to do questionable things on the field. During the dying moments of the quarterfinal match between Uruguay and Ghana in the FIFA World Cup, Ghana players went crazy and launched an epic attack to score a goal that would send them into the semifinals, making history in the process as the first African team to reach that stage. And just then, something unthinkable happened. Yes, just when a powerful header was about to enter the net, Luis Suarez extended his right hand and swatted the ball away. Suarez was asked to leave the ground with a red card, and Uruguay won the quarterfinals in a penalty shootout. This act of Suarez destroyed the first ever opportunity for an African team to qualify for the World Cup semifinals. But wait, Suarez isn't done just yet. The 2014 World Cup saw yet another controversial moment involving Luis Suarez. Man, does he know there are some rules that he needs to follow? Now, four years after his infamous handball against Ghana, he quite literally outdid himself again. During a match, he shocked the world by seemingly bunning an opponent. Now, fans wanted answers, and they were given both by Suarez and FIFA. FIFA also stepped in by announcing a nine-match ban and suspension from all football-related activities. Suarez uh, is suspended for nine matches and banned for four months from any football-related activity. For four months? This blatant cheating deserved such punishment. But what about our next sneaky trick? They got all the players fighting on the field. So what happened was, Leeds and Aston were pitted against each other in a football match when Jonathan Kajia was fouled and went down injured on the halfway line. Now, Leeds decided to play while the Via team wanted to go see their injured buddy and called for a kickout. Leeds midfielder Tyler Roberts slowed down as if he was going to stop the play but then fed Klitsch, who drove toward the box and scored an impressive goal. Now, Connor Harahan didn't like this cheekiness at all and immediately grabbed the goal scorer. And soon, two teams were facing each other. That huge scrap on the pitch resulted in Ahmed El Ghazi being sent off and, well, everyone's divided. Was it cheating or was it clever play? Uh, I know one thing for sure. No matter how clever this goal was, it's nothing compared to what our next player did. Nothing can be cleverer than playing dead to avoid a red card. Yes, see here. This is a straight red card. But here, even the referee is worried about how to show him a way out with the red card. The man isn't getting up. Holy mother of... He is playing dead only to avoid a red card. Stop it. It was a desperate attempt to avoid punishment and stay on the field. After all, it's pretty hard to send off a player who looks like they've met their demise. Good thing you cannot pretend to be dead forever. Kind of deceives the whole purpose of faking it. 
And here's another controversial move. Pepe and Alvis, and Alvis is down, wriggling in pain. Referees show the red card to Pepe. Let's see how hard the hit was. Oh, there wasn't any contact at all. And even if there had been, it wasn't as forceful as Alvis had reacted to it. Was that red card justified or not? You tell us in the comments section. And while we're at it, here's another foul. Ref says so, red card to the player. He's out of the game. And what? Wait, look, the ball has hit him here, and he's down with pain on the pitch with his hands here. Cheating. And that too, so at least bring some ingenuity to it, dude. Neymar's famous for his insane football skills, but you know what else he's famous for? His exaggerated reactions, and his finest acting performance came during the 2018 World Cup. As soon as he hit the ground, fans knew something was amiss. Within minutes, footage of his exaggerated reaction spread like wildfire across the internet, and countless memes circulated in the media. The trend was set, and even kids were seen mimicking the theatrics of Neymar. The move was dubbed as Neymar Roll. Looks like Donko Lazovic also took acting classes from Neymar. And when I came across this brazen move, I was quite literally taken aback. This was the worst anyone could do to Bo Nielsen during the Danish League. How did he even survive that? I wonder. It's 2009, and the footballing world was holding its breath as France and Ireland squared off in a high-stakes playoff match for a ticket to the 2010 FIFA World Cup. Fast forward to the dying moments of extra time with the score tied, it happened. The ball came to Thierry Henry, his extended left arm, and, with the delicate touch of a pickpocket, controlled the ball with his arm. With the ball now quite literally in his grasp, he played it into the path of teammate William Gallus, who slotted the ball into the net. Jaws dropped on the floors, many called for a rematch, but FIFA decided not to go for a do-over. Post-match, Thierry Henry admitted to the handball, but defended himself by saying it was an instinctive reaction, not a well-construed cheating attempt. No one can really talk about the 1986 World Cup without discussing the hand of God. What on earth is that? You might think it's nothing miraculous. I can tell you, in fact, it was a controversial move of Diego Maradona. So, the year is 1986, the match is the World Cup quarterfinal between Argentina and England. The game was heated, and Diego scored an impressive goal. The emotions ran high, and post-match, Maradona claimed he scored with a combination of his head and the hand of God, suggesting it was payback for Argentina's loss to England four years prior. All of this was wild, but even wilder was the time when a player got a lifetime ban for simply doing this. What's the deal here? Let's find out. Yorgos Katidis might have a simple answer to this complicated question. The then 20-year-old midfielder was playing for Athens against Varia in a match in 2013 when he scored a brilliant goal. It would have remained brilliant for him if he hadn't taken his shirt off and done this. Holy shit. Don't take this shirtless, armless stretch easy as it caused a huge controversy around the world and this Nazi salute made headlines globally, enraging everyone. The Hellenic Football Federation was quick to oust the player and voted unanimously to give him a lifetime ban from all Greece national teams. Crazy, right? But we're just getting started with this list, and the next we have is Cristiano Ronaldo. I never thought Ronaldo would make it onto a list like this, but back in 2019, things got pretty intense for Ronaldo and his team Juventus during the Champions League. They were down 2-0 against Atletico Madrid in the first leg of the round of 16. Ronaldo, being the challenge lover he is, took on the responsibility of driving his team out of its misery. In the second leg, he scored two awesome headers in the first half to level the score. So far, so good. But then came this celebration to mock Diego Simeone. Now, as much as fans would have loved it, several people, including UEFA, raised eyebrows at this wild celebration. Juventus went on to win the game, but Ronaldo was hit with a hefty $23,000 fine for his over-the-top celebration, but it was not as over-the-top as mocking a whole race with your celebration. Note the name Issa Alexander. Everyone used to wonder what this celebration was, 
until it dawned on everyone, and it was not cool at all. In 2020, there was a bit of a stir when Issa Alexander, playing for Persepolis against Paktikor in an AFC quarterfinal, pulled off a celebration that some found racially insensitive. The aftermath was no joke. The AFC, Asian Football Confederation, took a strict stand. Alexander got the boot from the tournament, was slapped with a $10,000 fine, and to top it off, he couldn't kick a ball for six months due to a football suspension. But even this is nothing compared to what happened with Liverpool legend Robbie Fowler for doing this. The only controversy in another unbelievably shining career, but Fowler decided to make it stand out. In the heated Merseyside Derby against Everton, after netting a goal, Fowler took things to a whole new level. He dropped to all fours and mimicked snorting substances off the touchline, but the celebration had a backstory. Everton fans had accused Fowler of using and this was his response. Whether there was any truth to the accusation is debatable, but what's not up for debate is that his own club didn't appreciate the gesture. Fowler ended up with a hefty 60,000 pound fine and a four match ban. The then manager, Gerard Houllier, famously claimed that he was merely imitating a cow eating grass, what? which is as absurd as our next player on this list. What the fuck? Emmanuel Adebayor doesn't exactly win the popularity contest. It's like the man has a built-in magnet for attracting hate, no matter where he is or what he's up to. Take for instance this time in 2009 when he scored against his old team, Arsenal, while playing for Manchester City. Instead of a modest celebration, he ran across the whole field to celebrate right in front of the seething Arsenal fans. What next? The fans threw everything they could get their hands on at him, which even injured a steward. Predictably, Adebayor got a yellow card for his little stunt. Oh, and in the same match, he decided to stomp on his former buddy Robin Van Persie, earning himself a three-game ban. But it's not even close to the next player who woke one day and caused chaos. Gareth Bale, the player who made fun of an entire fandom with his celebration move. So, the year's 2019. This is a super important match between Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid. After scoring an incredibly good goal, Bale decided to celebrate like this. And let me tell you, what Bale did and his celebration wasn't just a little bit rude. The move called Sleeve Cutter kind of asked the whole army of Atletico fans to shush. And the result? A massive 12-game ban for the Welsh player. But he's not the only player to mock huge crowds. Next on the list, we have Chivas Guadalajara players Fabian De La Mora and Alberto Medina. Now, you guys tell me, in a country deeply affected by violence, where thousands of lives are lost each year, what would have been a nice, warm gesture of celebration? Anything, but definitely not this. What the hell? The duo stirred up a major controversy in 2011 with their highly inappropriate celebration involving mimicking a gun shooting. The big shots of football were quick to take action and charged them with 50,000 pesos on each player. Good news, the players realized their mistake and issued a warm, heartfelt apology, unlike our next arrogant brat. Kai Kamara, the player who was making waves from the New England Revolution in 2016. During a face-off against Impact on Decision Day, when the team had already bagged a spot in the MLS playoffs, Kamara decided to spice things up. His celebration was more than just a fist pump. It aimed to stir the pot, escalate tensions with the opposing team. It's a move that got people talking and brought to mind a similar incident involving NFL star Antonio Brown. Now that's how you leave your mark on the game, but the referee wasn't impressed at all and slapped Kamara with a yellow card. <laughs> Next on the list is a player who got his full team banned from the stadium. In a heated Flamengo vs. Botafogo match in 2018, Vinicius Jr. stirred up some serious drama. He pulled off a controversial taunt during the game, supposedly celebrating a shot at making it to the Guanabara Cup Final. He just did this crying stunt and got his whole team banned from entering the stadium ever again. So, what was so sore about this celebration? Apparently, in 2008, Botafogo suffered an embarrassing loss and the players ended up crying in the press conference about refs being biased. And Junior literally tore them all a new one with this stunt 10 years later. 
A match between Aston Villa and Tottenham Hotspur in 1996 took a bizarre turn. Mark Bosnich, a former goalkeeper with Manchester United, decided to celebrate in a way that made everyone go, what on earth? What the hell? He thought it was a good idea to do an improvisation of Adolf Hitler right there on the field. Not cool. Especially since many Tottenham fans in the crowd were Jewish. Predictably, people were furious and criticized him a lot. Football big shots were not behind him either and hit him with a 1,000 pound fine. Well, given how Mark is the guy who was caught outside a strip five hours before his wedding, got kicked out of Chelsea for testing positive for substance abuse, and famous for his Nazi leanings, Bosnich got off pretty easy, unlike our next player. But imagine a celebration stunt that results in epic failures and lands you in the hospital. Now, we know only a few people in the game can pull off front and backflip combos quite like Lamana Lua Lua. But his days of somersaulting 10 times in a row were cut short at Portsmouth. While celebrating a goal, he injured his ankle during a landing. Something similar happened to our next Argentinian striker, who spent eight weeks in a hospital thanks to his failed stunt. In a match with LA Galaxy in September 2008, Fabian Espindola scored an impressive header and celebrated with his customary acrobatics, ending up injuring his ankle. <laughs> Cherry on top was the fact that the goal was ruled out for offsides. <laughs> and that's not it. The injury made him rest for eight full weeks, so he remained out of the field. Too much for a goal celebration. I mean, a no goal celebration. <laughs> but I believe embarrassing is better than receiving death threats, right? Paul Gaza Gascone known as one of the best English players of his time and quite a crowd favorite, found himself in a tight spot after his flute celebration during the 1998 Old Firm Derby between Rangers and Celtic caught everyone's attention. Just so you know, the flute symbolizes the Orange Order marches of loyalism in Scotland, a group that opposes the growth of Catholicism in the country. Now, what Gascone did was play the flute right in front of the Celtic fans. It came as no surprise there, when his club and the Scottish Football Association came down on him, slapping him with a 20,000 pound fine. As if that wasn't enough, Gascone received death threats from the IRA in the days that followed, proving how what might seem harmless can snowball into some serious trouble, exactly like what happened with Bentner. So during the 2012 Euro Cup, in the Denmark vs Portugal match, we saw something that we probably didn't want to see. After scoring a goal, he revealed the waistband of his underwear, sporting the logo of a betting company. Sneaky move, right? <laughs> well, the big shots in European football weren't impressed by the cheeky marketing stunt, causing Bentner to pay a hefty $135,000 fine and serve a one-game suspension. The big question is why was Bentner forced to pay such a big amount of fines? But even these insane bans will seem justified compared to the times when Zlatan, he insulted a whole country. So much so that he was asked to leave. Well, let's see that in his 15 yeah, most yeah. badass yeah. moments. If you want to play with fire, I'll bring you fire. Starting off with the craziest roast a player did after his red card. So the year was 2015, and PSG was facing Chelsea in the Champions League quarterfinal. Half an hour into the match, Ibrahimovic went in for a loose ball against Oscar, and the player was down in pain. Chelsea player surrounded the referee in anger as he showed Ibrahimovic a straight red card. Well, post-match, Zlatan was not at all chill about it, and he straight up called the Chelsea players. But that is not the worst. The worst is when I see when I get the red card, all the Chelsea players come around. That for me, I don't know. It felt like I had 11 babies around me. <laughs> it felt like I had 11 babies around me. Oh, that was harsh, but we're just getting started with it. And you've got to see how he handled a little push on the pitch. 14. Goalkeeper Gunnar Nielsen decided to approach Zlatan Ibrahimovic after a slight tussle following a red card of his teammate. But before he could say anything, the then Swedish striker casually threw the ball at his face, even without looking. 
the guy is savage, even without looking. Post-match, Zlatan was quoted saying, I didn't see him. It was a no-look pass. Good. I hit him. <laughs> 13. But that's nothing compared to the length Zlatan has gone to protect Messi. So we've seen our fair share of lions saving the goat on the field. But wait till you see this fiery controversy where Messi kind of received a death threat and Zlatan responded equally. The 2022 World Cup saw Argentina beating Mexico out of the league and the Argentine players partied hard in the dressing room. When the videos of the celebrations went viral, Canedo Alvarez was not happy. And when he saw Messi using a Mexican flag to clean the floor, he got really mad and tweeted about it, saying he should keep praying to God that he doesn't find him. Well, Zlatan wasn't having any of it and straight up called Canelo a clown. I don't know who Canelo was, but I see he's a clown. He touches Messi and the next day he'll be in the afterlife. And well, given what he did with the next player on this list, I don't doubt his statement. And even that is nothing compared to our top three picks, where Zlatan's badass attitude left everyone in the dust. 12. Post-match, Antonio Cassano was giving an interview. Zlatan took it as an opportunity to kick him right in the face. I didn't know one could do that to their teammates, but then again, it's Zlatan. When Zlatan kicks, it's not an insult, it's a blessing. Oh my god! And Cassano seemed to know that it was a friendly kick. You know who once didn't know that? 11. I didn't injure you on purpose and you know that. If you accuse me again, I'll break both your legs. And that time, it will be on purpose. Imagine who was on the receiving end of this deadly threat. It was Raphael van der Vaart. But when they both faced each other in a friendly match between Sweden and Ajax, Raphael was sent off injured by a tackle pulled off by Zlatan. And when Raphael accused Zlatan of purposefully injuring him, he was not happy. And an angry Zlatan is unstoppable. You can ask Lukaku. 10. October 2020. Ibrahimovic was in the red and black of Milan, Lukaku in the blue and black of Internacional, and the Milan Derby saw one of the biggest fights of the season. It all started with Lukaku arguing with Alexis Salmakers, the young Milan midfielder. Ibrahimovic stepped in. This is when everything just went flying. Lukaku. With insults and headbutting, there was no stopping Zlatan. That's one thing about this man. He doesn't like it when people mess with him. And one reporter learned it the hard way. 9. Yeah, he destroyed the reporter by insulting his wife. When he asked him about the scars on his face... A reporter asked you if you had any scars on your face, and you said... You should ask your wife. Exactly! You get a, you answer me a question, you get a answer. But insulting a reporter is better than insulting a whole country. Eight. This was his 500th goal. Santos lifts it into the area. Ibra! That too, at the age of 36. Before this, no one could imagine a player destroying a goalkeeper with an incredible spinning backheel flick. Likewise, when everyone was expecting Zlatan to retire, he destroyed Denmark in the playoffs by scoring twice for Euro 2016. And this is what he had to say about it. There was the thought that this would send me into retirement. I sent their entire country into retirement. Kind of reminded me of my number one entry, where Zlatan tried to end his teammate's career, but for now, we have him. 7. Breaking through the defense of the opposing team and scoring such an impressive solo goal, Zlatan had been humiliating teams for ages. This goal was the highlight of that match and season. You know what is the highlight of Zlatan's whole career? Him asking his coach to, you know, F himself up. 6. It takes a special kind of footballer to stand up to a manager like Guardiola, let alone tell him to go F yourself. 
and this player was none other than Zlatan Ibrahimovic. His departure from Barcelona left many fans puzzled. Why would such a talented player leave one of the world's top clubs? The answer lies in a clash of egos between Ibrahimovic and his manager, Pep Guardiola, whose preference for Lionel Messi over every other player at Barcelona didn't sit well with Ibrahimovic. My problem uh, in Barcelona was one man, and that's the philosopher. After New Year, a couple of months after that, he didn't speak to me anymore. I mean, if you have somebody that doesn't stimulate you, I mean, I will not fight for you. Despite his initial success at the club, scoring goals left and right, Ibrahimovic found himself increasingly isolated from his coach. And this is when he said this. Remember, players here don't come with Ferrari, Porsche and that. But why? Next game, I know I'm on the bench. Second game, bench. Third game, bench. Fourth game, bench. And the uh, fourth game, I bring my Ferrari. And I bring the Enzo Ferrari. It will create another situation. So I parked the car in front of his office. So, with me up. I said, you want to play with fire, I'll bring you fire, but I will burn you. There's How something. did he re react to you parking your Ferrari outside? He would not say nothing to me because he would avoid me. Uh, you called him a coward with no ball. When you buy me, you're buying a Ferrari. If you drive a Ferrari, you put premium petrol in the tank. You hit the motorway and you step on the gas. Guardiola filled up with diesel and took a spin in the countryside. He should have bought a Fiat. But what he said to a person on national television, I don't know if we're even allowed to say that. Five. You're even more ugly in television than reality. <laughs> what? Dude didn't just call him ugly, he called him uglier. Someone really needed to teach this man to hold his reins, because of what he did with LeBron James was even more disrespectful than calling this man ugly on television. Four. So we all know Zlatan is all in on Twitter, and when LeBron James joined the Lakers, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, the star soccer player for the LA Galaxy at the time, was quick to welcome him in his own special way. He jokingly shared a tweet saying that LA now has a god and a king, welcoming King James. LeBron thought it was all in good fun and tried to be buddies by sending Zlatan his jersey. But guess what? Zlatan didn't keep it as a souvenir. No. He signed it and sent it right back to LeBron. Now buckle up, guys. We're moving into our top three picks. Let me tell you, they are crazier than anything you've seen before. So, three. In 2018, not many Europeans cared much about the American League. So, when Zlatan left Manchester United for the California club, it was a huge surprise for everyone. But as confident as ever, Zlatan made his debut leaving sports reporters worldwide stunned when he did this. They couldn't help but applaud as he made a grand entrance, showcasing his skills right from the start. Now that's what you call making a first impression. But what he did with the French people wasn't a great try for a first impression. Two, when Zlatan joined PSG, French people weren't really up for accepting the football legend, quoting his arrogance, to which he replied, Do you call me arrogant? And French people are famous for being arrogant. So I'm exactly like you, so you should love me. Oh, and even that was not it. And politicians demanding him exit France, the country. In a match against Bordeaux, PSG faced an early setback, but Zlatan managed to equalize quickly. However, tensions rose as PSG struggled in the second half and conceded another goal. Thankfully, a penalty in the 85th minute gave Zlatan a chance to shine, and he didn't disappoint, scoring to level the game again. But just when it seemed like they would settle for a draw, Bordeaux scored again in the last minute of the game, leaving Zlatan furious. He didn't hold back his frustration, criticizing the referee. Don't even deserve this be in this country. This didn't sit well with Marine Le Pen, a French politician who demanded Zlatan leave the country if he didn't like it. 
PSG, concerned about the negative attention, asked the player to issue an apology, clarifying that his comments were made in the heat of the moment and weren't directed at the people of First France. First of all, was not aiming for the, for the people or whoever there. When I said it, I was, I was angry in that moment. And whoever felt offended or took it in a wrong way, if they took it, I mean, I apologize for them. I have no problem. <laughs> One. Remember that iconic moment when Zlatan proclaimed, I am a lion? Yourself on the pictures believing you were a lion. Is that right? I am a lion. You are a lion. Well, in 2010, he didn't transform into a lion, but rather into a martial artist. Spoiler alert, his kung fu move nearly ended a man's career, but there was a lot more to the story. And for that, you have to go back to 2006, when Marco Matarazzi, also known as Matrix, dared to provoke Zlatan during a match between Juventus and Inter Milan. Big mistake. Zlatan doesn't take kindly to threats. He tried to get up, but he was wailing in pain. But Matarazzi had a hard lesson to learn. Despite being teammates at Inter Milan, their past didn't matter. Zlatan harbors grudges and isn't one to forgive easily. Fast forward to 2010, the stage was set for their rematch in a heated game between Inter Milan and AC Milan. With a history of bad blood, Zlatan didn't hold back. A kung fu kick and a flying elbow left Matarazzi nursing his wounds in the hospital. When asked about his actions, Zlatan showed no remorse, admitting he'd been waiting for this moment for four years. Zlatan was pissed with the referee in France, but even that referee will look great before the one who ignored an almost dead player on the field and did nothing to help him. Starting off a shot so crazy, even the ref didn't know what happened. Liverpool vs Chelsea in the UEFA Champions League semi-final of 2005 was a clash of titans, where Luis Garcia attempted a shot as soon as the ball flew into the box. And after that, it was all chaos. Chelsea, Luis Garcia is in there! Has that crossed the line? The Liverpool fans think it has. What a start by Liverpool! Liverpool players didn't stop to see if it was a goal or not. They just celebrated their crucial lead. Doesn't matter what you and I or Chelsea players think, the ref at that time thought the ball crossed the line, so it was a goal. But even a terrible decision as this is nothing compared to this refereeing madness. The 2005 Premier League clash between Manchester United and Tottenham Hotspur saw Pedro Mendes making this spectacular shot from a distance which clearly crossed the line, but the Manchester United's goalkeeper, Roy Carroll, fumbled the ball and brought it back into play. Now, even if the whole universe and things beyond it thinks the ball crossed the line, the ref says otherwise. And not only him, his assistants also failed to spot the incident, denying Tottenham a legitimate goal. Do you think this was harsh? Wait till you see the next one. Yes, this incredible goal! So, tensions were as high as ever in the quarterfinals of Euro 2004. England faced Portugal, and the heated moments of the game... What? No one knows what dubious foul that ref was talking about, but the goal was disallowed. And this is what Sol Campbell had to say about it. Because that was just like... It wasn't a foul, was it? It was John Terry it was called on. Yeah, but it's the like ball's gone that way, the keeper's that way. I, I still think if it was, if it was Portugal scoring, it, it, it'll be the goal. You think this was some lousy refereeing? Nah. That was just me prepping you for the worst referee decisions ever. <laughs> yeah, boy. With refs ignoring deadly fouls, making bizarre decisions, and being high on... The worst is yet to come. Now let's take things up a notch with a crazy match that Chelsea fans won't be forgetting anytime soon, all thanks to Tom Henning of Rebo. In the crucial UEFA Champions League semi-final match between Chelsea and Barcelona in 2009, things were super heated. And with this banger in the ninth minute from Michael Essien, Chelsea took the lead and they kept the lead for a solid 82 minutes until Andres Iniesta equalized the score. But wait, there's a little twist to the story. 
During the buildup of this goal, there was an alleged handball by Barcelona's Samuel Eto'o. But failing to notice it, the ref allowed the goal to stand. Not only that, at several points in the match, Chelsea players were fouled but not given penalties. To keep that one in, he was really caught by surprise then. Good play by the leader, he goes down. Here we think this had... Drogba just smashed. Lampard has helped it through, and Drogba controls. He's gone down, the referee looked at his linesman, and... A guard here. Anelka, is that handball against PK? The referee says no. Oh, yeah, you see. Oh, does he move hand? Terry, Eto broke from him. I lost count of the number of times the ref just wasn't refereeing the match. But Chelsea fans claim that dude robbed them of not one, not two, but four well-deserved penalties. Barcelona eventually won the match and moved to the final. Chelsea striker Didier Drogba wasn't having any of it, and famously confronted the referee in a post-match interview. Tom was lucky he was just confronted by an angry striker for his mistakes and didn't end up in jail for 10 years like our number three pick. For that, let's see a referee decision so bad it cost a country its place in the final. England was facing Denmark in the Euro 2020 semi-final with Danish team scoring first with a great free kick by Mikkel Damsgaard. But England was in for a fight. They tied the game nine minutes later and forced extra time. This is where things got a bit spicy. Raheem Sterling entered the 18-yard box and fell. Now hear me out. Despite no contact from Joachim Mela, the referee awarded a penalty. Now, to say Danish players were angry would be an understatement. The ref stood by his decision even after consulting with the video assistant referees and refused to review the incident on the pitch side monitor. The Danish keeper, Kasper Schmeichel, saved Kane's spot kick, but the England captain netted the rebound, sealing England's path to the final. Now, this obvious corruption cost Denmark a place in the final. But even this was nothing compared to allowing a foul that almost cost a human life at number one. But before that, let's talk about an awful referee decision that resulted in one of the most debatable decisions in football history. So the year was 1966. It was the FIFA World Cup final. England against West Germany. And during one of those tense moments, Jeff Hurst took a shot which bounced off the crossbar and came down close to the goal line. Did it cross? Did it not? Well, the referee thought it did, awarding England the crucial goal, which helped them win the World Cup. Fans were still fiercely arguing whether that ball truly crossed the line or not. 20 years later came arguably the most controversial goal in World Cup history. So, the year 1986 saw yet another controversial decision made by a referee in the quarterfinals of the FIFA World Cup. Argentina was clashing with England when Diego Maradona did something unbelievable. He leaped into the air and punched the ball into the net with his hand. Tunisian referee Ali Ben Nasser missed the blatant handball and gave the goal. The protest of the English players made the ref seek the advice of his second linesman, who also confirmed the goal. But all thanks to this man, Mexican photographer Alejandro Ojeda Carbajal, who captured this famous hand of God in a photograph in which Maradona can be seen hitting the ball with his hand. A stroke of genius or mischief? It was the hand of a rascal. No, 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 it's not cheating. I couldn't reach it, and, and Shilton was already there, so I, I couldn't head it, so I did like that. Speaking of mischief, this next referee completely destroyed the hopes of English fans. Now, in which universe is this not a goal? Well, if a goal line looks like this, we can positively say it was not a goal. Otherwise, England faced Germany in the 2010 FIFA World Cup, and the English were down 2-1 against the Germans. The match was already heated when Frank Lampard made a thunderous shot that hit the crossbar and bounced down, clearly crossing the goal line. Everyone saw it. Spectators in the stadium, players in the field, commentators in the box, 
fans in their homes. Everyone saw that spectacular goal, except for the referee. Needless to say, despite the ball clearly going in, the goal was not given. But if you think that was a foul decision making, wait till you see this blunder that was so bad, the referee cried. Told when he, that he had made a mistake of this magnitude. So what did he do? Well, not much. He just didn't see this. He's on the back to Gallus and it's easy, but... That's a handball, no question about it. Absolutely no question. Yep, but that was no little mistake. In 2009, Ireland was facing France in a crucial World Cup qualifier. The score was tied, tensions were high. In the dying moments of extra time, the ball flew towards Thierry Henry, who handled it not once, but twice to prevent it from going out of play, and then passed it to William Gallus, who diverted it into the Irish net, scoring a decisive goal for his team, and Martin Hansen allowed the goal. The Football Association of Ireland called for a replay, but FIFA added insult to injury by declaring that they have asked for 33rd position at the World Cup instead of any sanctions on the player or referee. What the hell? This was a real burn, but compared to the next pick, I would say even this one was first degree. In the UEFA Champions League semifinal match between AC Milan and Barcelona in 2006, everyone was on the edge of their seats, and then AC Milan's star striker, Andriy Shevchenko, scored a banger. A goal that would have been a total game changer if it was accepted. The goal equalizer came in the 70th minute of the game. Everyone went wild, but hold on a second. The ref stepped in and said, nope, that's a foul. Dude just tried to shove his opponent out of the universe. What'd you do? Needless to say, replays later suggested there was almost no contact, if any. But even such a blunder seems like a masterstroke compared to this. In the 2012 match between Milan and Juventus, Sully Montari thought he had scored the goal that gave Milan a 2-0 lead. But nah, the referee simply ignored it like nothing happened. Yes, despite replays clearly showing that the goal was legit, the ref didn't give it. Total shocker, right? But wait, even corruption like this looks legit compared to this next bad decision. So in 2013, Stefan Kilsing's incredible header sent the ball flying into the net. This ball, after it got netted behind the goal line from the side, defied physics, science, and anything that comes in between until they spotted the hole in the net, which technically meant the goal was illegal. Now, anyone officiating football matches for, let's say, five years, he got his FIFA badge in 2005, should know that a ball cannot enter the net defying the laws of physics. Well, anyways, Stefan Kilsing's 70th minute header against Hoffenheim was awarded by the match referee Felix Bridge, making it one of the most bizarre goals of modern football. But at least this man was honest with his job, unlike the next one. Yes, before moving to today's top three picks, I have this last bit of an insane match officiating for you. So, ever watched a game and thought, something fishy's going on? Well, everyone who watched Robert Heuser definitely thought so, and unfortunately, those suspicions turned out to be spot on. Heuser was a ref in a Germany Cup who got caught red-handed taking a bribe. Dude pocketed 46,000 pounds in a TV set just to mess with a German Cup match between Paderborn and Hamburg. A TV? That's a wild choice of item to take as bribery, but what do I know? So now, Paderborn, the underdogs, were struggling. So Heuser decided to give them a leg up. He awarded them two extremely unjustifiable penalties and even sent off one of Hamburg's players. It was so bad, he kind of gave himself in. His little game didn't last long. He got busted, dragged to court, and eventually ended up with a two-year, five-month prison sentence. But even taking bribes couldn't crack our top three. Buckle up, guys. We're starting with the top three worst referee decisions. And at number three comes a referee that called a jail cell his home for two and a half years. 
The 2002 FIFA World Cup match in the round of 16, Italy faced South Korea. Italians were blunt, taking a lead with an early goal from Christian Vieri in the 18th minute. Now, South Korea wasn't just going to sit there and let the Italians win. They managed to equalize the game in the 88th minute. The match was pushed into extra time and then, with a BAM, in the 117th minute, South Korea pulled off a stunning goal, securing their spot in the quarterfinals. But the star of the match wasn't any player or fan, it was the referee, Byron Moreno from Ecuador. He made blunder after blunder, and most of them seemed to favor South Korea. There were so many mistakes, I can't even name them all. He messed up big time by not giving Italy a valid goal and wrongly called an offside with his assistant. And here's the kicker. When Italy's legendary player, Francesco Totti, got fouled in the penalty area, which should have been a clear penalty kick, Moreno somehow saw it as simulation and gave Totti a second yellow card, sending him off the field. It was a nightmare for Italy. But wait, there's more. Moreno let some pretty brutal fouls from the Korean side slide, putting players' safety at risk. Some experts even calculated that Moreno made a whopping 30 incorrect decisions against Italy. It's like one mistake every three minutes of play. After the match, all hell broke loose. Riots erupted in the city, and popular Italian commentator Bruno Pizzol called it a broad daylight robbery. Moreno got suspended multiple times by the Ecuadorian Football Federation after the World Cup, and then came the real banger. On September 2nd, 2010, at JFK Airport in New York City, Moreno was caught trying to smuggle a whopping six kilograms of in his underwear. Initially facing a 10-year sentence, he ended up serving only two and a half years. When Italian goalkeeper Gianluigi Buffon heard about Moreno's smuggling antics, he couldn't help but quip, six kilos of I think Byron Moreno already had them in 2002. Not on him, inside him. Talk about a wild ride from start to finish. But even this was good enough for the number three spot. Because at number two, is a referee who created his own football rule by awarding the same player three yellow cards. Damn! What? It was the 2006 FIFA World Cup match between Australia and Croatia, and as you can expect, things were heating up on the pitch. But the real drama unfolded when in between all the kicks and tricks, Croatian footballer Josef Simunic found himself in a tight spot with the referee, Graham Pohl. First, in the 61st minute, Pohl whipped out a yellow card for Simunic after a rough tackle. Fair enough, right? But then in the 90th minute, Pohl reached into his pocket once again and flashed another yellow card at Simunic for yet another foul. But hey, where's the red card? Did he forget to show it? Well, the simple mistake left Simunic still playing on the field. And just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, Simunic argued and pushed Graham Pohl and received a third yellow card. Believe it or not, he managed to survive not one, not two, but three yellow cards in a single match. But why wasn't he sent off then? Well... It wasn't until after the game that Pohl realized his blunder and how it happened. In the interviews conducted afterwards, Pohl revealed he placed his name under the wrong team, which was Australia. What the hell? Wait, what? Well, the real guilty party was Simunic's accent. Despite playing for Croatia, he actually grew up in Australia with a pretty distinct Aussie accent. With all the chaos and tension on the field, Pohl made a big error. He was using a player tracking system where he noted down the names and jersey numbers of players who got booked, and for Simunic's first yellow card, he wrote it down under an Australian player's name instead of putting it in the Croatian column. Later in the game, when Pohl flashed another yellow card at Simunic, he should have realized his mistake, but he didn't. And then again. Talk about having an accent or being forgetful. Huh. Good thing, though, the mistake had no impact on the match's final outcome. So, while it may go down as one of the wildest moments in football history, it can in no way compete with our number one entry, which kind of destroyed a FIFA World Cup semifinal and someone's whole career. 
Yes, France and West Germany were dueling for a position in the World Cup final in 1982. Both teams were deadlocked 1-1 when Patrick Battiston entered the game as a substitute. His teammate, Michael Platini, made a daring run through the heart of the German defense and passed the ball to Battiston, who had the perfect opportunity to take a shot, and he did. But suddenly, he was on the ground, his body limp, face pale, and no pulse. Platini legit thought he was dead. Now hear me out. The man had broken vertebrae, lost two teeth, fell unconscious, needed oxygen on the field, slipped into a coma, took six months to fully recover, all thanks to the brutal tackle made by the German goalkeeper, Harold Schumacher. Who raced towards him, twisted his body, and hit his hips right into the Frenchman's face. And what did the referee do? Nothing! No penalty, no red or yellow card for that matter. Nothing! It was blasphemous to allow such barbary. Referee Charles Corver later admitted that he hadn't seen the incident and was more focused on the action with the ball. The match ended in a thrilling 3-3 draw after extra time, with West Germany eventually winning in a penalty shootout. That ref was too slow to do his job. Unlike this guy, who is so fast, defenders have to wrestle him down just to stop him. These are the 10 fastest footballers in the world. And first off, a guy so fast, defenders have to wrestle him down just to stop him. Adama Traore is known in football for only two things, pace and power. And when he hits his stride, he's practically unstoppable. Well, unless you're these defenders, to end this endless hugging, Traore rubs baby oil on his arms so defenders can't grab him. Talk about a slippery customer. But even a well-oiled machine like Traore was only good for number 12. How about a guy so fast, he was forced to reveal the secret behind his blistering pace. Chelsea went all out to try to get a goal against Dortmund, but from a well-defended corner, this happened. Damn, this guy is quick. He ran past the defender at a top speed of 36.5 kilometers per hour. Three, two, one, and lift off. Skipped past the goaltender like he wasn't there and did a backflip just to rub it in. What the? This dude was so fast that the reporter had to ask him his secret. Tell me what you eat, because I want to be as fast as you. I eat uh, a lot of uh, African food, <laughs> um, but I have uh, good genetics for my, for my dad, so I think it's a little bit um, um, uh, difficult for you to get <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I have some trouble. What's the African food called, so I can look it up? Uh, it's uh, called fufu. What is it called? Fufu. Fufu? Yes. From where is that? Nigeria. Nigeria. Yes. Okay, I'll look up some fufu to uh, start eating. It's also very good. No wonder he's that quick. Maybe I gotta try some fufu. But even with a Nigerian secret, Adaimi is nothing compared to a player so fast, he anticipated the future. Since his breakout year as a wingback at Inter Milan, Atraf Hakimi has built up a reputation as a player who goes up and down the right flank with devastating pace. <laughs> But perhaps his most impressive show of speed was when it was rumored that his ex-wife didn't get a share of his assets in their divorce case. Hakimi had earlier on moved fast by saving everything in his mother's name. But even such quick thinking is nothing compared to the guy who was the fastest player of the 2022-2023 UEFA Champions League season. Usman Dembele is one of the most talented players in the world. Even so, that Barcelona's president claims he's better than Kylian Mbappe. Huh? Have you, wait, wait. Oh. <laughs> but what makes him stand out is his ridiculous speed. Dude is so fast, he makes other players look like they're running in slow motion.
Despite his speed, he hasn't been able to outrun the injuries that have threatened his career. And speaking of careers, this next dude was so fast, he ended a legend's career. Mudrik became the most sought-after winger in the world when he announced himself in the UEFA Champions League. Just look at him rip through the Madrid defense again and again and again. But it was on his debut for Chelsea that he took things a notch higher. I mean, faster. Yo, look at this. This dude is dancing around the Liverpool defense like they don't exist. It's speed like this that made Milner end his Liverpool career. He will not be the last. Absolutely, you will see an awful lot of this. But how an even faster guy that can't have enough of football? No list of the fastest footballers in the world would be complete without this man. <laughs> Scorpio. Cristiano Ronaldo scores for the second time on the night. onto the scene in 2003, Cristiano Ronaldo has built a reputation as a fast, a very fast, and ruthless footballer. But you would expect that after over 800 goals, 260 assists, and 5 Ballon d'Or, he would probably be on a beach somewhere relaxing. But this dude said, nah, you guys can't be having all the fun without me. In a match against Newcastle in 2021, Ronaldo ran at a crazy top speed of 32.5 kilometers an hour at the age of 36. 36? Not read the script. At this rate, the man's breaking all the laws of physics. But don't get me wrong, the players up to this point are crazy fast. But even one of the greatest footballers of all time couldn't break into our top six. Here's the point we turn on the afterburners, because this next guy sprints like he's running from death itself. All the players on this list so far have all been attackers, because everyone seems to forget the guys who chase them down. We all know Antonio Rudiger for his hard tackles, short temper, and silly antics. But what most of us don't know is that this dude is crazy fast. When chasing down attackers, this dude can hit top speeds of 36.7 kilometers per hour. And with these galloping runs, he's sure got some extra horsepower in his legs. But even a guy like Rudiger is nothing compared to the next guy who's so fast, he was nicknamed a roadrunner. Me, 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 me. They have to buy a roadrunner. If you're a fan of Looney Tunes, then you probably remember the Roadrunner show. But did you know there's an actual bird named Roadrunner? Yes, a bird. 
and that thing is crazy fast. These birds are capable of hitting a top speed of 40 kilometers an hour, and Alfonso Davies is capable of giving them a run for their money. Just look at this. Man gave Erling Holland a 50 meter head start and still caught up with him just before he could take a shot. And speaking of head starts, this dude made defenders look like they were running backwards. Perhaps the most accurate description of a player with pace and power, Gareth Bale will go down in history as one of the fastest players of all time. He completely destroyed Mikan in the Champions League tie against Inter Milan, but his most iconic show of speed. Bale looking to use his weight. Well, he was taken out of it by Bartra, or tried to, but the referee's played a good advantage. Bale using that pace. Can he finish? Was when he did this against Mark Batra. He left him chasing shadows. But even a player like Bale couldn't crack our top three. Fasten your seatbelts, hold on to something, because we're entering hyperspeed. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts. Ich muss einfach sagen, ich bin nur dankbar. Sehr, sehr dankbar. Und jetzt macht er sein Tor. Und ich will das selber machen. Und er macht die. Robin! Ein unfassbares Tor. Robin! 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 Starting off with this insane acceleration and speed. If you were actively watching football between 2010 and 2017, then you remember Arjen Robin as one of the best footballers in the world. He terrorized defenses with his speed, dribbling, and accurate shooting, and was well known for the famous partnership with Frank Ribery, known as Robbery. But perhaps his most famous heist was when he did this in the 2014 World Cup. Oh my god, how did he do that? Man just turned on the nitrous boost to pick a ball he was never meant to get. This goal was so epic that he had the Spain coach rethinking his life choices. But even a speed monk like this is nothing compared to our next player who gives defenders only one choice. Foul him or watch him ride into the, I mean run, into the distance. Since Mohamed Salah signed for Liverpool, he became the most important player in the team. And having become the club's all-time Premier League top scorer, he'll go down as one of the greatest Premier League players of this generation. But the key to his success has not been his skills and dribbling, but his frightening pace. With the ability to hit speeds of 37 kilometers an hour, there's no way that defender is stopping him. Unless you're Sergio Ramos. But even Sala was only good for number two. Go beaten to that by Mbappe. Watch him go. Mascherano won't get near him. So now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Not only football's fastest player, but a guy many claim could beat Usain Bolt in a race. During a match against AS Monaco in 2019, some people claimed Kylian Mbappe had run faster than Usain Bolt. He clocked a mind-blowing 38 kilometers an hour, which was identified as being faster than Bolt's average speed from his 100-meter world record in 2009. This sounds crazy, but oh my god. When you see Mbappe run, you find it hard to doubt that. Look at his long strides and the instant acceleration from a standing stop. This guy eats up space and is never full. To think of an Mbappe versus Bolt race, that would literally break the internet. Thank you.
Now, all these players were super fast, and they still don't come close to Messi when he paid $5.3 million just to avoid jail or spend $40 million to overcome his childhood fear. Messi's Rare Disease It's hard to believe that we almost couldn't have witnessed all those great goals of Lionel Messi because of a rare disease. Yes, Messi's journey to football stardom suddenly faced an unexpected halt due to growth hormone disorder called GHD at the age of 11 years old, which basically meant his growth was stunted. From playing on the grounds and impressing the world, Messi one day found himself in a hospital as doctors, noticing an unusual lack of growth and unchanged appearance over the years, suspected a health anomaly. After running tests, they diagnosed Messi with the disease that not only stunted his physical growth, but also affected his cognitive functions. Though the situation was critical, the condition was treatable through monthly injections, but the cost was around one to $5,000 a month. This was a dark period for the young and passionate football player, but this is when Barcelona stepped in. They offered a helping hand if Messi showcased his potential in a workout. Messi, with determination and talent, left the scouts awestruck and got himself the monthly treatment package and his first ever contract on a napkin. Messi, the legend of Ronaldinho. But things weren't easy for Messi after joining Barcelona. The man was shy and often felt anxious around the older, stronger players. But then he found his savior, who helped him make what he is today. Messi is the biggest success tale from the legends of Ronaldinho, who himself was a superstar of Barcelona, with the power to pull in crowds like no one else. But after meeting Messi, he knew he was and could be better than Ronaldinho. Sensing the potential of Lionel Messi, he crucially assisted him in scoring his first goal. And after that, the superstar stepped back and let Messi score more goals, speeding up his journey towards success and slowing down his own. The legendary Kobe Bryant, who was close friends with Ronaldinho, once said that Ronaldinho believed that Messi was something special and he would be the greatest player ever. He remembered the conversation where Ronaldinho introduced him to the 17-year-old Messi, saying the kid would be the GOAT. Ronaldinho didn't just give him emotional support off the field and professional support on the field, he also passed on his iconic jersey number 10 to Messi, which he considered a huge honor. Messi took on the responsibility and went on to score 641 goals, becoming one of the greatest football players ever. Ronaldinho's mentorship and sacrifices paved the way for Messi's legendary career of hard work and consistency. But that was not the only thing Messi worked hard for. He spent $40 million to overcome his one particular fear. Fear of cars. Looking at the $40 million exotic, lavish, and luxury car collection of Lionel Messi, it's hard to believe that the reason behind this is not his lifestyle, but safety choices. A maxophobia, the fear of traveling, driving, and riding a motor vehicle, is the biggest fear of our football star. And the history of traumatic family accidents in which his brother and father were involved also didn't help elevate it. Just so you guys know, Messi is really close to his family. His trademark goal celebration, where he points towards the sky with both index fingers after scoring, is a tribute to his grandmother, Celia, who passed away when he was young. It's a gesture to honor her memory. So, I was saying the accidents didn't help his fear, and this deep-rooted reason is why we see Messi spending exorbitantly on Audis, Maseratis, Paganis, and even a 1957 Ferrari Spider. It was never about luxury, it's about safety. Since he had to travel a lot and he had this consistent anxiety of riding a motor vehicle, he did extensive search, which led him to believe that high-end car brands offer superior safety features and durable parts which helped him ease his anxiety during travel. This led to spending more than any athlete on a $40 million car collection. This is how far Messi goes for his safety, but that doesn't mean he's safe from robbers. Heist Alert Now, Messi doesn't just have a fleet of luxury cars. The man is a walking ATM thanks to his watches, gadgets, and other high-end daily use items. And some robbers made him a target of their heist on August 10th, 2021. Messi had recently signed up with PSG in France and had decided to stay at the prestigious Le Royal Monceau Hotel in Paris, paying a staggering $18,000 a night. 
Unfortunately, the news leaked, and as soon as he made it to the hotel, fans cheered and paparazzi snapped photos, revealing his exact location to the world, making him the prime target of a criminal group studying Messi's habits for years. They made a plan, and despite heightened security measures, they executed their balcony climbing maneuver to reach his room, making off with jewelry and cash totaling $40,000, never to be seen again. But he did find a chance to fulfill his long-held inner desire. Homeland Love Despite spending most of his professional career in Spain with Barcelona, Messi's consistently expressed his love for his homeland, Argentina. Though he's played for both FC Barcelona and the Argentina national football team throughout his career, he started his career with Barcelona's youth academy, La Masia, at a young age, and his entire professional career with the club spanned 2004 to 2021. His time at Barcelona was incredibly successful, and he became the club's all-time leading scorer, but still, his wish to win a big title for his homeland was deep in his heart. In 2021, Messi's association with Barcelona came to an end due to financial constraints faced by the club, leading him to join Paris Saint-Germain PSG in France. Despite changes in his club career, Messi's commitment to representing Argentina has remained consistent throughout his football journey, and he fulfilled a lifelong dream by winning the Copa America with the national team in 2021. Junk Food Addiction Barcelona not only helped Messi overcome his genetic issue, they quite literally made big changes in their stadium to stop Messi from having soda drinks. Yep, Lionel Messi has battled his secret addiction to junk food so much that he couldn't go one day without it. Despite warnings from coaches like Pep Guardiola, he just couldn't resist a soda, even on game days. Now, we guys know Pep. He is not the one to tolerate disrespect. So, he ordered the removal of all the vending machines at Barcelona's facility to curb Messi's habit. Nevertheless, soda companies and their marketing teams were not far behind in noticing Messi's love for drink and his influence on people. They approached him for endorsements, and now Messi not only showcases his football skills in Pepsi commercials, but also has his own signature Pepsi can, turning his habit into a money-making venture. I'm telling you, this lad has some serious knack for business. I mean, wait. I'll tell you in the next entry, The Messi Verse. Would you believe the money-making acumen of Messi if I tell you that he has recently started something which is bound to make him a billion dollars? The football legend decided to level up everything for himself and his fans by creating the Messi-verse. With the rise of crypto and NFTs, he thought of crafting his own world record-setting NFT collection, proudly naming it the Messi-verse. The teaser alone was no less than a hype, amassing over 32 million views. He then received three pieces from his collection. Starting a worldwide frenzy among his fans, and on launch day, it became the most expensive sports NFTs ever, giving the footballer a whopping $3.4 million, with the rarest piece, a gold one-of-one one version, priced at $1 million, now valued at over $9 million. Messi versus ongoing limited edition NFT drops are expected to reach over a billion dollars in terms of collection, but what use is this money if it makes him end up in jail? Our next entry is about the unexpected jail time Messi had to serve, tax fraud. Messi has been making tons. He became the face of Adidas in its commercials, joined forces with the legendary Kobe in high-flying airplane ads, and outsold every other soccer player in jersey sales. But when it came time to paying taxes, he felt shortchanged compared to what he should have paid. Well, Spanish courts were quick to smell something fishy in the situation, and out of the blue, Messi found himself under a rigorous investigation for his income dealings. Messi's dad, George, was also in troubled waters and had been handling all financial matters, attempting to help Messi save as much money as possible. He was stashing Messi's earnings in foreign investments, particularly in tax havens like Belize and Uruguay, where tax rates were lower. This went on for years until 2016 when Messi made headlines facing a 21-month prison sentence for tax fraud. Both Messi and his dad were charged with defrauding Spain of over $4.1 million in taxes. Messi said that he had no involvement in the scandal, but for the judge, it was hard to believe that someone like Messi wouldn't know where his money was going. Both father-son duo were charged guilty. George got a 15-month prison sentence while Messi was slapped with 21 months. 
Luckily, his immense wealth came in handy because his expensive lawyers ended up saving him from jail sentence. Though he faced fines of around $255,000 for him and $190,000 for his dad. Eventually, he paid a final $5.3 million to settle all the owed taxes, but out of the frying pan, he fell right into the fire with yet another controversy, private jet. Now, I feel like this one was unfair and uncalled for. Messi is known to make headlines across the globe, but this time, he's made them for all the wrong reasons. You know, the man needs to and ought to travel a lot, and he decided to buy his own private jet to make things easier for him. He invested $15 million to make a grand entrance wherever he goes, but things quickly changed for the worse. It became one of the biggest controversies of his life. Messi had a persistent stalker named Zach Louie who tracked all of his flights from June 1st to August 31st. It was revealed that Messi's plane flew 52 flights, which makes it around 368 hours of flight, resulting in 1,502 tons of carbon dioxide, which is more than an average French citizen does in 150 years. He said that his private jet was contributing greatly to the environmental pollution and he should avoid traveling in it, thereby landing Messi in a great controversy. Whose side are you on in this one? I'll side with him over this. You know what else I'd root for? The amazing love story they have. The amazing love story. The love story of Lionel Messi and Antonello Rocuzzo is nothing short of a fairy tale that started on the streets of their hometown of Rosario, Argentina, when Messi was just five years old. He was childhood friends with Antonella's cousin and often visited the house when Antonella came there to spend the holidays. He used to write her love letters, and she used to watch Messi and her cousin play for the Newell's Old Boys Club in their younger days, but then Messi turned 13 and moved to Barcelona to pursue his dreams. Although the pair were still in contact, they really weren't in a relationship until five years later when tragedy brought them back together. In 2005, Messi received a call about a fatal car accident in which Antonella's best friend, <laughs> Ursula Notz, died. Messi jumped on the next flight to Argentina to comfort her, and during this time, he also convinced her to move to Spain with him. Since then, they've been inseparable and tied their knot in 2017 in their hometown of Rosario, Argentina. But even such an amazing love story pales in comparison when it comes to CR7 cleaning streets. This rare clip with much more. Here are the things you definitely didn't know about Ronaldo. Unwanted pregnancy. It'd be hard for us to believe that a legend like this man was not wanted initially. Yes, not many people know this, but a theory swirls around that CR7 was an unwanted pregnancy and his mother didn't want to have him in the first place. After she got to know that she was pregnant with a baby, she started drinking heavily to force a miscarriage because she couldn't either afford an abortion or raise a baby. The theory has substantial support among the CR7 fans given the financially shaky childhood Ronaldo had. Well, I did my research and I couldn't find any credible information to prove that he indeed was an unwanted pregnancy or that his mother attempted to force a miscarriage through heavy drinking. And if any of you in the comment section know this, I would love to hear it from you. But I did find something unbelievable. A young Ronaldo cleaning the streets. Cleaning the streets to filthy rich. From this to this. The story of Cristiano Ronaldo is my favorite rags to riches story. This clip of him cleaning the street as a kid recently went viral. And well, the netizens couldn't be prouder of the football legend. While there are no credible reports or widely known information about CR7 being a street cleaner as a child, some resources and articles do quote the difficult early life he had and how young Cristiano cleaned roads in Madeira to support his family with additional income. Who knew that this small cleaner with a bright smile was going to become one of the wealthiest footballers in the history of sports with a staggering net worth of hundreds of millions of dollars with some typical reports claiming it to be well over a billion dollars, including a Forbes 2023 report. But the path to his immense success was actually paved by someone else. Albert, the best of all best friends. Imagine sharing the same passion and dreams with your best friend, but eventually one of you will have to make it to the top. Something similar happened with Cristiano Ronaldo and his best friend, Albert Fantrau. 
The stage was set for the Under-18 Championship, and a scout from Sporting was in attendance, searching for the next big talent. For both boys, it was more than just a match. It was rumored that the scout from Sporting had only one spot left, and he made a private agreement with the boys. Whoever scored more goals in this crucial match would secure their spot in the Sporting Academy. In Ronaldo's own words, the story goes like this. I have to thank my old friend, Albert Fantrow, for my success. We played together for the same team. When a scout came to see us, he said, whoever scores more goals will come into our academy. We won that match 3-0. I scored the first goal, then Albert scored the second with a great header. But the third goal was impressive for all of us. Albert was one-on-one -on -one against the goalkeeper. He rounded the goalkeeper, and I was running in front of him. All he had to do was score that goal, but he passed it to me, and I scored the third goal. So I got that spot and went to the academy. After the match, I went to him and asked him why. Albert said, because you are better than me. After this quote from Ronaldo, the media went berserk and began searching for this man, Albert Fantrow. One journalist tracked him down, and to her astonishment, found herself at the doorstep of a sprawling mansion with an impressive collection of luxury cars. The curious journalist inquired about Albert's lavish lifestyle, to which he responded succinctly and enigmatically, Ronaldo. It's amazing how one-word answers can stir the world, just like in this next entry. CR7 and his alcoholic father. Piers Morgan conducted an interview with CR7 in 2019, during which he discussed his father, Jose Denis Averro. Jose died of alcoholism in 2005 after his participation in the war against Mozambique took a toll on him. During the interview, Piers showed Ronaldo an exclusive clip of his father from an interview he had given to a Norwegian TV station. The clip of his late father instantly brought out emotions in Ronaldo, and when his father talked about how great his mother was for Ronaldo, he was all in tears. Talking about the pride his father felt for him, our dearest footballer once again broke down on national TV. We feel for you, CR7. We understand how challenging it is to live with an absent father. During the same interview, CR7 revealed that he went through the worst moment of his life when he lost his son. But that wasn't the only dark time of his life. His jail sentence was no less than a nightmare for him. Two-year prison sentence. While CR7 is known for his speed, skill, and strength on the field, and often makes headlines for his incredible goals, off the field, he shocked his fans when he was found involved in a tax fraud case in Spain. In 2017, Spanish authorities charged him with tax evasion, accusing him of using offshore accounts to conceal his earnings from image rights while he was playing for Real Madrid between 2011 and 2014. The legal team of CR7 proved equally skillful, and the man reached a settlement with the authorities in June 2018. He was given a suspended two-year prison sentence and a fine of 18.8 million euros. But in Spain, first-time offenders of nonviolent crimes can serve their sentences under probation. So Ronaldo did not actually serve time in prison, but he did spend some quality time in a fitness regime. Bizarre Fitness Regime now, this was something I never thought CR7 would be a part of, but here we are. Published in 2017, the bizarre video features a topless Ronaldo with the fat comedian named Christian Busseith, wherein both men go through a series of unbelievably funny exercises. The man was basically hired to motivate Ronaldo to put on some weight. The fat but fit trainer of CR7 shared his secrets with Ronaldo so he could reach peak fitness levels. The video also went on to explain how Ronaldo was suffering from fitness problems and motivation. The host said, and I quote, Chris is in a very difficult phase in his life. He's not in shape, not eating healthy. We need to find a golden goal. Don't worry, all these shenanigans were just for some good belly laughs, but the contrast between the bodies of these two men was insane. Just like our next entry. Funny commercials of CR7. Now this is something I have been waiting to share with you guys. I wonder how much he was paid to do this commercial. Call them funny, bizarre, or outright weird, watching CR7 in commercials is always fun. And for the shop he had alone, he signed the deal at $21 million in January of 2019 for a two-year sponsorship. 
The athlete also bags around a million for each endorsed Instagram post. He's known to earn hundreds of millions of dollars through commercials, ads, and endorsements alone. So we can say it pretty safely, that as much as the world loves CR7 watching on and off the field, the marketers are ready to pay him as much as he wants. Faster than me. Hit at head and heart. Nothing is faster than CR7, and experts have recently made it clear. They've discovered that Ronaldo has the ability to kick footballs at speeds of up to 80 miles an hour, making it a formidable challenge for anyone facing these nearly lethal shots. For one steward girl, the nightmare was real. In 2021, Ronaldo launched an inaccurate strike, and the ball flew like a rocket and hit a steward girl right in her head. The girl dropped instantly. Ronaldo rushed to see if the girl was okay. When he saw that she was fine, he returned to the warm-up. But once he was free, he found that girl out and gave her his jersey. That was another hit, but right at her heart. Ronaldo knows how to win the hearts of people, especially of little fans. CR7 with little fans. Before starting, take a look at this clip. A young Japanese fan of Ronaldo tried to speak Portuguese with him, but the crowd laughed at his attempt. This is how Ronaldo defended him. You speak good Portuguese. Every now and then, we see a clip of CR7 giving warm hugs and free autographs to his fans. He's known to visit sick children at hospitals, make random visits to schools, and is involved in various charitable endeavors and initiatives aimed at helping children, both in Portugal and other parts of the world. Overall, Cristiano Ronaldo treats his young fans with kindness and generosity, and he often goes out of his way to make their experiences memorable. World Records to his name I've lost count of how many world records CR7 has to his name. In Guinness World Records alone, he has around 40. He is the most liked person on Facebook, the most followed individual on Instagram, the most charitable professional athlete in the world, the highest paid footballer, apart from his incredible on-the-field records. One of my personal favorite feats of his inhuman endeavors is his shocking and gravity-defying jump against Sampdoria. It was not only a world record, later studies on the jump revealed how unbelievable the metrics of that jump were. Ronaldo generated 5G force on that takeoff and leaped over 28 inches off the ground, reached the ball 2 meters in the air, and held it there for over a second, making that leap one of the most iconic moments in sports history. Despite this gleaming streak of world records, his biggest accomplishment, in my opinion, is his philanthropy. You have no idea how much this man gives back to the world. Remarkable Philanthropic Initiatives Ronaldo became the most charitable athlete in the world, and this record to his name cost him an insane amount of money, but his commitment to help as much as he can and as many people as he can doesn't swerve. Just when Syria and Turkey were hit by devastating earthquake in 2023, this man sent planes loaded with care items for the affected victims. The cost was valued at around $350,000, but this is just a little part of his long list of donations. He paid $83,000 to fund a child's brain surgery and aided a cancer center in Portugal with $165,000, donated a million to Portuguese hospitals during the height of the coronavirus pandemic, and made a personal cut of $4 million in his personal payment by the club so no employees of his club would be laid off. He also served as an ambassador for Save the Children, UNICEF, and World Vision, cementing himself as the most charitable athlete in the world. But hey, look to see why and how Ronaldo Jr. will replace both Messi and Ronaldo in future. His contributions on the pitch shocking the whole world. But is he just a natural talent or a clone of his father? Let's find out. Number one, overhead kick magic, inheriting greatness. You all remember the iconic, historic overhead kick of Cristiano Ronaldo for Real Madrid in the Champions League against Juventus in 2018, right? Well, just weeks later, Ronaldo Jr. replicated the same feat in a youth game. The remarkable execution of his father's overhead kick highlighted two main things. Genes of soccer brilliance that Jr. Ronaldo inherited, and the training and mentorship he received from his father. After watching this father-son feat, people started saying that football skills and techniques run in this family and have transcended from father to son. Ronaldo always says that talent without hard work is nothing. And he definitely taught his son the same thing. But some people say that young Ronaldo is more impressed with Lionel Messi than his father. Is this really the case? Number 2. 
Messi-like moves, a fusion of styles. Now, who doesn't know this legend? He's GOAT, and he looks like he's influenced Ronaldo Jr. too. In 2018, during his debut for Manchester United's youth team, it was pretty evident that the kid has been a fan of Messi. I mean, the execution of the La Croqueta move was simply incredible, and showcased not only his technical abilities in the game, but also his versatility, drawing parallels between two of football's greatest icons, Messi and Ronaldo. But there is one thing in which he's left both Messi and Ronaldo behind, even at such a tender age. Number 3. Defender Embarrassment Beyond the Ordinary Yes, no one could believe a thing like this was even possible. During his Juventus days, Ronaldo Jr. went beyond ordinary plays several times, but once, he displayed a move that not even his illustrious father had attempted. In what we can only call graceful maneuver, Junior Ronaldo went around defenders and left the goalkeeper completely confused, and scored an incredible goal. The display of such a skill meant that this young prodigy will one day rule the football realm. This was the time when people said that Junior Ronaldo has taken himself out of the shadow of his father's great legacy, and he'll make a career of innovation and excellence in football. But is this really the case? Can Junior Ronaldo really beat his father? Let's see. Number 4. Free Kick Mastery – Following in Ronaldo's Footsteps We all know who's mastered the art of free kicks. It's the trademark of Cristiano Ronaldo's incredible career. But guess who decided to level up that free kicks game? It's none other than Cristiano Ronaldo Jr. People were shocked to see the resemblance between the early career of Senior and Junior Ronaldo. His ability to strike the ball with precision, power, and accuracy at such a young age mirrors the early career of his iconic father. It's the resemblance like these that make us say that Ronaldo Jr. is a legacy in the making. And my next entry may prove my point. Number 5. Father-Son Goal Replication – Creating History Okay, so who has seen or heard about this before? Many of us might remember the majestic goal of Ronaldo against Chelsea. Would you believe it if I told you that Ronaldo Jr. collaborated with Nemanja Matic's son to replicate that goal? Repeating that goal was not just a moment of pure skill, but it was also about creating a historical connection. This unique goal, where the sons of two football legends reenacted their father's glory moments, symbolized the generational shift within the sport. It's like passing the torch of legacy from one generation to a new and promising generation. I'm not making it up, there are signs of it. Wait, I'll show you in the next entry. Number 6. Hat Trick Hero – Early Signs of Dominance Ronaldo Jr. owns the football field, and he proved it when he scored a hat trick for the Juventus Academy in 2019. It was as if he was establishing his dominance in the ground, and with the remarkable abilities to navigate through defenders and finish with precision, made it a lot easier to claim it. All of his goals are not just simple additions to some numbers, but a glimpse into his potential, a fact that even CR7 admits. What, don't believe me? Well, let's move to the next entry and see how Senior Ronaldo appreciates Junior Ronaldo. Number 7. Skills in front of Ronaldo – Impressing the Maestro While spectators were showering their love and admiration for Junior Ronaldo during a Portugal match, he managed to get some appreciation from none other than his father, CR7. It's a well-established fact that Ronaldo Senior is a strict teacher, often making his son do impossible exercises and practices. After all that hard work, if our junior Ronaldo has showcased his skills on the ground, a little nod of admiration from his dad is the least he deserves. That proud dad-son moment highlighted the familiar support and encouragement that define their bond. But that's not the only bond junior Ronaldo is focused on building. Number 8. Perfect Celebration and Nutmeg – Flourishing Talents Junior Ronaldo is more than pure football talent. He's an entertainer with a knack of making the crowd go crazy because of his showmanship. The way he celebrates his goals with the iconic Sue shows his ability for entertaining the audience. He shares a special bond with them. Moreover, his filthy nutmeg. I mean, have you guys seen it? How incredibly amazing that is? The way he executes a filthy nutmeg on a defender level is beyond words, proving not only his technical prowess, but also his ability to amuse the audience. Mixing sports skills and art, Ronaldo Jr. has set himself apart as a contributor to not only the scoreboard, but to the overall joyousness of the game. It looks like nothing is impossible for this kid, not even moving from one team to another. 
Number 9. Seamless Transition to Al Nasser Youth Team While many may feel a bit out of element after changing their team, Ronaldo Jr. easily managed his transition to Al Nasser in Saudi Arabia. He was quick to adapt to the Arabian weather, scoring a classic Ronaldo finish in his debut for the Al Nasser Youth Team. His debut performance was nothing short of spectacular. His move alongside his father showcased his ability to be not afraid of change and showed how he's determined to leave his impact, even in the unfamiliar terrain of a new footballing environment. It's his consistency that sets him apart. Number 10. Impressive Free Kicks – Consistency in Excellence There have been many, many matches in which our junior has impressed the lot with his impressive free kicks. Whether he was at the Juventus Academy or in front of his father at Juventus, Ronaldo Jr.'s was consistent in displaying nothing but excellence. Observers, experts, and fans, everyone is shocked by his incredible ability to navigate and dominate set-piece situations, hinting at his deep understanding of the nuances of the game. He's not just a mere product of genes, but a result of relentless commitment and hard work. Number 11. Learning from the Best – Ronaldo's Signature Moves what is one thing which is synonymous with Senior Ronaldo's prime? If you guessed his iconic Ronaldo chop, you're right. And the good news is, Ronaldo Jr. has already started incorporating his father's signature move into his game. Nice. The resemblance is uncanny. The moves are all almost identical. People say that Junior Ronaldo learning CR7's moves and flawlessly executing them is a symbolic bridge between a great past and an even greater future. But before that, I need to show you the greatest goal of Junior Ronaldo. Number 12. Unpredictable Goal – Fueling the Opponents Here you're about to see the best goal of Junior, where he had everyone fooled. And by everyone, one, two, three defenders and this goalkeeper, making a total of four people who were dumbfounded by the excellent moves of Junior Ronaldo. No one knew where he would go. Number 13. Early Triumphs, A Glimpse of Promise During an away game for Manchester United's youth team, Ronaldo Jr. made a remarkable half-volley goal. This was the time when he had just started playing and still managed to demonstrate his technical prowess. Those early career goals also hinted at the potential greatness that lay ahead. The celebration, a mere image of his father's iconic Sue, added a touch of familial legacy to his budding career, an indication that football runs in the Ronaldo family and greatness belongs to them. Now, Junior sure has some great moves, but these impossible goals from level one to all the way to level 100 has craziness like no one else. Level one. In 2017, the Arsenal vs. Crystal Palace match showcased an unbelievable goal when France forward Olivier Giroud scored with a scorpion kick. The audacious, acrobatic effort occurred when Giroud received the ball from Alexis Sanchez and he hit the net for Arsenal. Level 2 – Brazil vs Sweden Edson Arantes do Nascimento, aka Pele's legendary goal in 1958 World Cup Final, is a feast for the eyes. Level 3 – Lionel Messi showcased his football prowess when he scored an epic goal for Barcelona against Getafe in 2007. Level 4. The year, 1988. Netherlands versus USSR. Marco van Basten scored an unbelievable goal in the European Championship Final. Level 5. If unbelievable free kick goals had a father, it would have been Roberto Carlos's Brazil versus France goal in 1997. Level 6. Called Goal of the Century. Next, we have Diego Maradona, who scored an epic goal in Argentina versus England in the 1986 World Cup. Football at its finest. Level 7. The electrifying final of the 2002 Champions League reached its peak when Zinedine Zidane scored a stunning volley against Bayer Leverkusen. Level 8. The World Cup Final 1970. The greatest team goal ever. Finally, scored by Carlos Alberto in the Brazil vs. Italy match. The ball was passed between nine players before being hit into the net. Level 9. Classics from the archive of the 1978 World Cup. RG Gamel making an incredible goal for Scotland, embarrassing Netherlands players with his pure gold football skills. No words. 
level 10. And who doesn't love Dennis Bergkamp's epic goal in the 1998 World Cup for Netherlands against Argentina? Level 15. Manchester United and Sheffield United were tussing against each other in a 1970 match when George Best scored a fantastic goal for MU. Level 20. Witness this insane acrobatic goal of Barca legend Johan Cruyff against Atletico Madrid in 1974. If skill and perfection had a face, this would be it. Level 25. Meet the man who made Brazil cry, Paulo Rossi. So, the year, 1982. The tournament, the World Cup, the match, Italy versus Brazil, and the goal, nothing short of legendary. Top scorer and best player of the 1982 Cup, Paulo Rossi, will always be remembered for this iconic goal. May his soul rest in peace. Level 30. The crowd couldn't cheer more when Neymar scored this amazing goal for Santos against Flamengo in 2011. Level 35. Ronaldinho at his finest for Barcelona against Chelsea in a 2005 Champions League match. Level 40. And now it's time for Michael Owen's class apart goal for England against Argentina in the 1998 World Cup. That was some next level maneuvering in skill. Level 45. Carlos Alberto decided to take Sao Paulo down with him when he scored this marvelous goal for Fluminense in 1977. Level 50. Manchester United versus Arsenal, 1999 FA Cup. Ryan Giggs has the ball. One, two, three, four, five. Great retention of the ball and into the net. An unbelievable solo goal. Level 55. This goal from Saeed Alouaren was voted the 16th best in World Cup history in Holland, and I can see why. An amazing solo goal for Saudi Arabia against Belgium in the 1994 World Cup. Level 60. How about this amazing goal from Alessandro Del Piero in the Juventus Borussia Dortmund match in 1997? Level 65. Our next goal on this list made David Beckham a legend. The brilliant halfway line goal against Wimbledon for Manchester United in 1996. Nothing short of pure skill and talent. Level 70, another Pele goal that deserves our appreciation. Brazil versus Czechoslovakia, 1970 World Cup match, when the legendary footballer scored this amazing goal. Level 75, another amazing goal. It'll go down in history as George Weah's best goal. He scored it for AC Milan against Hellas Verona in 1996. Level 80, hands down the smoothest goal in football. Before this goal, no one could say if anything like this was even possible. Hats off to Thierry Henry for scoring such a beautiful goal for Arsenal against Manchester United in 2000. Level 85. No one can forget Eric Cantona's epic game of 1996, Manchester United versus Sunderland, when he lifted an already unforgettable game to new levels with this superb volley to win the FA Cup. Level 91. Another great goal, this time by George Hagi for Romania against Colombia in the 1994 World Cup. Level 92, this one's from the 1990 World Cup, and I just want someone to explain it to me. I mean, this is unimaginable skill, and the execution is perfect. Robert Baggio for you guys, scoring for Italy against Czechoslovakia. Level 93. The World Cups of the 70s, 80s, and 90s have shown us some serious skill and football prowess. Here's another one from 1982. Marco Tardelli making an impossible goal possible for Italy against West Germany. Level 94, the most unbelievable and greatest of all bicycle kicks. Wayne Rooney will always be remembered for his incredible goal for Manchester United against Manchester City in 2011. Level 95, David Villa hit the ball into the back of the net in the Spain vs. Honduras match from the 2010 World Cup. And this is the kind of goal which looks more and more impressive every time you rewind it and watch it again. As epic as a goal can get. Level 96, Paul Gascoigne's goal against Scotland is one of the greatest scores ever for England. So, the year's 1996. Everything from this fabulous kick of Seaman to Gascoigne's goal is nothing short of legendary. 
Level 97, FIFA Puskos Award nominee Alessandro Florenzi scoring this mind-blowing goal for AS Roma against Barcelona in 2015. It's a shame he couldn't win the award. Level 98, what a run. Hands down the best run before scoring a blasting goal. Bulgaria's Histro Stoichkov will always be remembered for this incredible goal against Mexico in the 1994 World Cup. Level 99, Juan Roman Riquelme scoring one of the best goals of his career in 2000 when he played for Boca Juniors against Corinthians. Level 100, and if this video didn't feature the famous 30-yard bicycle kick of Zlatan Ibrahimovic against England in 2012, this goal was legendary. But Messi and Iniesta putting every other player on the field to shame was a third-degree burn that looked impossible. Just like this, this, and this. Sit tight, and let's begin with this. The bicycle kick and the celebration dive. Impressive indeed. Ron Alexander, the man who saved the whole season for his team with his amazing header. Magnificent game. And how many times can a save like this be repeated in football? Goalkeeper Higuita made this historic save in 2007, showcasing his incredible skill set. I'm just appalled by how convenient Messi made this goal look easy to us. What team coordination and what a goal. Before Zlatan scored this epic, epic goal, a 30-yard bicycle kick that made it into the net looked like a far-fetched idea. Ladies and gentlemen, made possible by Zlatan Ibrahimovic against England. And how is it that for a goal, Denmark's Thomas Delaney scored an audacious goal in training? What a great scorpion kick. Wait, let me show you how this seemingly impossible goal was made possible. Unbelievable. Nothing. It's just Messi and Iniesta putting every other player on the field to shame with their unbelievable skills and football prowess. Fabulous. Look at this impossible save by Thibaut Courtois. Well, when you play football for so long, your legs can steal some of the skills from your head. Goes to his right hands. And how's that for a bicycle kick? Even the opposition players are like, WTF, we came to play too. Not for getting disgraced like this. And there was no saving this goal. Remember when something happens, but you just can't believe it has happened? Here's that in the football world and the precision with which this player has hit the ball with his head. Truly amazing. People called it the ghost goal of Bayer Leverkusen's Stefan Kielsing, and rightfully so. I mean, just explain this to me. How is this possible? Looked pretty possible until the net hole was discovered. That was not a goal, but considered one. Five goals in nine minutes. How achievable does this look? Robert Lewandowski made the impossible possible right before our eyes in 2015. First, second, and third goal in just three minutes and 22 seconds. Here comes the fourth goal at five minutes, 42 seconds. And another magnificent fifth goal after eight minutes, 59 seconds, hands down to the greatest solo performance of a striker. Great coordination and magnificent goal, amazing. And this isn't the most selfless assist you've ever seen in football, remarkable. Another great assist, but missed. How could you miss that dude? Dedication and fitness at its peak. That ball was not gonna enter the net in any way. Challenges? Nah, I'm going to run this ball through these players and give a crucial assist to my teammate. I just lost count of the players that were in front of the ball. It was simply one verse all and an incredible goal. That's one match where Goody was on fire. What an incredible assist for Benzema. 
And tell me, whose goal are we counting? Here's another moment where Goody just shined through. And how amazing is this for a penalty kick? Here's a 1000 IQ moment, just like a boss. Header, long pass, flying kick, dodge, pass, great run, assist, and goal. What a legendary counterattack. Amazing. Here's another counterattack that won't get repeated anytime soon in football history. You have to be unbelievably confident in your skills to save a penalty with backflipping like this. When the luck of the whole universe teams up with you, you can defend the penalty no matter how many infinite times it bounces back to you. Jose Manuel Pinto's funny penalty save has to be one of the most iconic saves in football history. England vs Brazil. Joe Hart's hyper-diligence mode was activated to prevent the penalty against Ronaldinho. And he did it! Epic. Joel Mal greatly defended a twicely bounced back penalty. An amazing one. Great reading of the opponent by Tim Howard and an equally amazing save. Saving this goal was impossible for this goalie. Hands down the most difficult save in football history. And here is the closest a player has been to scoring a goal. So close, yet so far. Count the players in front of the goalpost. Now count the hits. Incredible how the goalie held onto the football like it was his dear life. One word for this, smooth. There was no way this goalie was letting this ball enter the net. You don't think that was fast? That ball has hit the net at a whopping 108 kilometers an hour. That's insane. Football game at its finest. And what's happened here? Frontezek Plotch instantly stops the ball in an amazingly incredible way. And this dodge was embarrassing. And here is probably the best comeback in saving the penalty in football. What was that? This happens when your psychological tricks fail to work on the opponent. Okay, that's life, hitting me again and again. Emiliano Martinez is called Flying Keeper for a reason. What an amazing penalty save, handled brilliantly. Next is Guillermo Ochoa on the list of who double saved the penalty from Union's Montero, adding a win to his team's bucket. Messi scoring a goal for Inter Miami in his debut match with so many players in front. Hats off to the GOAT. And how is that not a goal? Seriously, this epic kick that resulted in the ball entering the net was not accepted as a goal. You know what's more unbelievable than all this? The times when SPL banned his players from heading the ball and FIFA stopped Cameroon from wearing their own kit? These 10 banned things in football are gonna blow you away. Let's find out. No heading ball. A couple of years ago, the SPL introduced a controversial ban that left many people baffled. Glasgow University research found that former footballers were three and a half times more likely to die from brain disease. What? In response, the Scottish Football Association imposed a ban on professional footballers, prohibiting them from heading balls the day before and after matches. But that wasn't the end of it. Prior to this ban, there was already a restriction on headers in training for under 12 teams nationwide. It may seem like a what the hell do type of thing to you, but it is what it is. Just like when CR7 was apprehended for celebrating his own goal. Controversial goal celebration. We've always seen some of our favorite players making fabulous goals, taking off their shirts for the goal celebration, and then getting a yellow card. While very common, goal celebrations that involve shirt removal are banned in football and can result in a yellow card. 
I mean, we all remember the brilliant game Manchester United versus Villarreal was, and the last minute goal of CR7. Ronaldo took his shirt off during the celebration and got a yellow eventually. The rationale behind this ban is player identification. The referee identifies all the players with the numbers and names. Taking the shirt off can confuse the referee. It becomes even more evident in international games where the referees don't know the players of remote countries and faces could look similar to them. Some people, however, say that the sponsors want the jerseys with their logos on the players so the audience can see them on screens. They pay insane sums just to showcase their brands, and taking off a shirt during goal celebrations can really ruin that marketing chance. And I think those some people have got a good point, just like I have a point to make in the next football ban. Bans for fans So far we've seen quite a few controversial moves pulled by FIFA and IFAB, but a few months ago they really took it up a notch, hitting the high notes with the 2022 World Cup. As the tournament drew near, the excitement was palpable. Well, why wouldn't it be? Qatar was gearing up for an influx of football fans from all corners of the globe, ready to cheer on their national teams. However, it seems like someone forgot to double check on what these fans were all about until the 11th hour. Qatar, with its strict alcohol policy, threw a major curveball, especially for fans from places like England, where a good time often involves a pint or two. Imagine the shock when they found out that their beloved beverages were literally banned. And while I tried my best to grasp the political and religious reasons behind it, it's still a bit of a puzzling, or should I add, controversial move, just like the next ban. Neymar's Fortnite Boots So, you know Neymar, right? The dude's big into gaming and even has his own Twitch channel. Well, to hype up some Fortnite thing, he swapped out his usual Puma Z boots for these crazy custom Fortnite kicks. But here's the header. Turns out they're a no-go, according to the new rules. Basically, there's this ban on boots with any political or religious messages or ads for different brands. So, as awesome as Neymar's new Fortnite boots were, he couldn't rock them anymore. It's like when someone asks you, how are you doing? And even if you're not fine, you gotta say you are. <laughs> Neymar's boots, though, at least weren't causing a crisis for a whole bunch of kangaroos. Beckham's Boot Revolution all right, so the year's 2007, and David Beckham made the move from Real Madrid to LA Galaxy. In the midst of all the excitement, things, quite unexpectedly, took a serious turn. The British animal welfare group Viva showed Beckham a video of kangaroos getting the short end of the stick. And get this, they're supposedly the same kangaroos used to make his Adidas boots. It hit him like a ton of bricks. Fast forward to when the California Supreme Court got wind of what was going on with Adidas and their kangaroo leather boots. The court was quick to drop the bomb and banned Adidas from selling any boots made from kangaroo leather. It was a big deal. And what did Beckham do? He didn't waste any time. He switched to the synthetic version, making a clear stand against using materials that caused harm to animals. It's like he said, nope, not on my watch, and made a quick pivot to a more ethical choice of synthetic leather. Something that Paul Mullen should have done. Mullen's Political Slogan the key player for Wrexham AFC made headlines across the UK for his specially crafted boots and a chanting incident at McDonald's. The player shared an image of his customized footwear featuring an anti-conservative party slogan in October of 2022. Here's what was written on the boots. So the club was quick to impose a ban on striker Paul Mullen for sporting boots adorned with a political message. The message, which reads F the Tories, was edited out on the shared image and also issued a formal statement. Though they asserted the right to individual opinions, the club deemed Mullen's actions an unwelcome distraction, saying the players should focus on the game and team management should focus on making proper kits, otherwise they might get banned. Don't understand it? Wait for the next entry. Cameroon's Disaster of a Kit So, back in the 2002 World Cup, teams were dropping their new jerseys, and everything was cool, until Cameroon entered the scene. They rolled out their take on the World Cup kit, and FIFA was like, What the hell? What on earth is this? FIFA wasn't vibing with Cameroon's bold choice and straight up asked them to swap those controversial kits before the World Cup kicked off. FIFA spokesperson Keith Cooper even called them vests instead of shirts. Talk about a shirt move gone wrong, but do you want to know about a band which is more controversial than this disaster kit? Wearing Jewelry 
Yes, apparently wearing jewelry in matches pose a threat to the players. It came as a surprise to many people when a match was stopped and France's World Cup round of 16 clashed with Poland because of a piece of jewelry that defender Jules Koundé was wearing in the match. The game was put on hold and the chain was removed from his neck in the first half of the game. It was at this point when many football fans came to know that players are not allowed to wear jewelry during matches for safety reasons. The ban is on such items as necklaces, bracelets, and earrings. I see some rationale behind this. Imagine a player wearing a chain goes up for a header and the chain gets caught on an opponent's finger or jersey, leading to potential injuries. The chain must come out, but it's not the only thing that gets removed from your neck if you're a football player. Sometimes, a thing as simple as snood cannot be allowed to wear. Wearing snoods Yes, according to the eighth president of FIFA, Joseph Sepp Blatter, snoods are dangerous and can hang somebody. What the hell? Now, even if I ignore all the legitimate, life-threatening, barbaric tackles allowed in football, I'm not sure how a neck warmer can hang somebody. A number of top players, including Carlos Tevez, Samir Nasri, David Silva, Mario Balotelli, Pepe Reina, Maro and Schumach have made a snood part of their uniform. All I wondered was what their thoughts were on the ban. Nonetheless, a ban's a ban, and you gotta respect it. Good thing is snoods or neck warmers were banned for a period, and now the ban is over. But you wanna know what one ban would be permanent? The next one. Shoes with hidden spikes. No one knew anything like this could have potentially happened, but the star players Wayne Rooney and David Beckham of the English football club Manchester United suffered repeated metatarsal injuries, reportedly from bladed football boots. Such injuries have the capacity to end the careers of players, and since then, many UK sporting bodies have criticized and banned the bladed football boots. Any kind of unusual equipment that may give the player an unfair advantage is prohibited to use in football. We knew this part, but we didn't know that unusual equipment meant shoes with hidden spikes that could end the career of football players. But what about something that can actually end their lives and careers? Mandatory Shin Guard Rule Playing without wearing a shin guard is banned in football, and this ban makes the most sense of all the bans I have told you. Recall the ban I mentioned earlier regarding bladed boots at Manchester United? Sir Alex Ferguson took swift action when he discovered the detrimental impact of these boots on his star player, Roy Keane. Despite Keane's formidable skills on the pitch, a serious injury resulting from a tackle kept him sidelined for two months. Upon receiving the scan results, Sir Alex was alarmed to find marks from bladed boots on Roy's shin. This revelation prompted an immediate ban on all forms of bladed boots at Manchester United. Just imagine the potential severity of the injury if Roy hadn't been wearing shin guards. So, we're not messing around with this rule. It's strictly a no-go. Safety first, always. And now, how is that not a goal? The ball entered the net, but was not accepted as a goal. Don't wonder, and watch this with me. Starting off with a trick so crazy that it got a player banned for four months just because he knocked out the dude executing it. So, Brazilian player Curlon Moura Souza made a name for himself with his insane seal dribbling skills. In a league match against Atletico Mineiro in 2007, he did his signature move, which infuriated Atletico Mineiro's Coelho, who elbowed Curlon hard on his face. Everything and everyone exploded on the field right after the elbow. Coelho was slapped with a 120-day ban, which was later reduced to just five games. But FIFA wasn't happy with this seal dribble thing, which makes it almost impossible for the defenders to get the ball back in a legal manner. So, they banned it. Now, no matter how cool it looks, you won't see players like Neymar and Ronaldo doing it on the ground. Unlike the next trick, which is completely banned and still, almost every single football player is seen adopting it. Yeah, yep, you're right. I'm talking about this. The annoying, irritating habit of players where they just pretend to be fouled, lay on the ground, break dancing, or act their way to win Oscars just to get free kicks, penalties, or advantage over the opposition. But guess what? Diving is basically cheating, and if you get caught, well, I would say things might not go as you would like them to go.
Neymar, famous for his exaggerated reactions, was booked for diving and given a red card against Strasbourg while representing PSG. So, suspension, yellow, or red card is what you might get served in an official football match. But hey, we're just getting started, and this list is going to move even more crazier. Coming back, at least a player fakes an injury when diving, but in the next trick, there's no faking, because it might actually land a player in the hospital. Okay, so this is Marco Verratti. And what has he done to get a yellow card? Wait a minute, what has just happened here? Let's watch someone else do it. Here we have Ivan Perisic, and here he goes. Oh, what? Booked? For what reason? So you probably already know that a player cannot back pass the ball to his goalkeeper, but some players found their way around this rule by heading the ball back to the keeper. What the hell? Well, FIFA wasn't going to let anyone mess with their back pass rule, no matter how insanely amazing the trick was. So to say that FIFA was mad would be an understatement. So they brought out the big book of their laws and explicitly said this. While the ball is in the air and you pass it with your head back to the keeper, it's acceptable. But if the ball's on the ground, whether you head it back on all fours or by flicking the ball up and then heading it back, big no-no. It's banned. Sounds crazy, right? It's nothing compared to what I have for you at number one, so you better keep watching. Next up is an insane football skill that you'll see street players to YouTubers to professional athletes performing. Norwegian right back Jan Gunnar Sully performed this trick where he got the ball under his shirt in an attempt to skip past the challenge of Digger First Lowell Ismail and got booked. Now, this might be the go-to move of many football players, and why shouldn't it be? Flicking the ball and trapping it inside your shirt looks great. But in an official match, on the ground, during the minutes? Well, a player can attempt a shirt catch. Of course he can, but not without getting booked. Well, FIFA says that the shirts of the players are an extension of their arm, making it a foul to trap the ball inside the shirt. Busted, right? Now, if a player doesn't want to look like an overeaten uncle on Thanksgiving in the field, he should just avoid doing this. Same goes for neck stall. Now, this is not an easy thing to do, nor is it a legal thing to do. You might have seen many players doing this during warm-up matches where they kick the ball up in the air and trap it on their necks. Looks amazing, right? Nice. Well, wait till a player comes and hits you right on your neck to get the ball. And this is exactly why neck stall is banned. And before moving on to our top three picks of the video, we have a trick which is banned for all the right reasons. Catching the ball in your knees and running with it, trapped in your legs? Wait, what? It's almost the same as picking the ball in your hands and running with it, which automatically makes football not football. Okay, that didn't come out right. But prepare to be booked and stopped right in your tracks if you ever try to do running knee locks in an official match. But there's a good chance that you play in the streets just like me, and we are good to go with it. Buckle up now. Time for my top three picks. Just so you know that only the craziest of tricks and bands have made it here. Ronaldo. Look how he attempted this incredible trick to perfection during his training. Let him try doing this in a game, and he'll be out in no time. Either after being tackled by an opponent or by the referee for using an illegal trick. Let me tell you why. Headstall is regarded as disrespectful to the opponents and unsportsmanlike overall. Just like neck stall, seal dribble, and low headers, there's a strong chance of getting kicked, elbowed, or hit in the head if an opponent tries to take the ball from you. So, a big no no. Although, some match officials might just let players get away with a head stall sometime. Our next trick, Got Neymar a Yellow Card, is considered banned across the world, and no one exactly knows why. They say it's showboating. I say it's game at its finest. But what do I know? But wait, hear me about the ban at least. So, remember that time when Neymar was tackled in a match against Strasbourg? Guess what? He didn't like it. And what did he do afterwards? This. Isn't this the most peaceful, most badass way of asking someone to stay in their effing lane? But FIFA just straight up banned this fabulous trick. I mean, it's not explicitly illegal, but the referee can book you for it. 
In a match against Montpellier in 2020, the Brazilian legend was actually given a yellow card for simply existing and doing this. Everybody enjoyed it, except the match official, who saw this trick as an act of showboating and thus deemed it necessary to show Neymar a card. Even he was taken aback. So, all in all, this caused some serious controversy in the football world, but as of now, Rainbow Flick is considered banned. But even this trick is nothing compared to how insane our number one trick is and how insanely stupid it is to ban it. So what's the biggest problem in attempting a free kick? Getting the ball into the net, right? Well, some genius players from Coventry City executed this in 1970 to score against Everton FC 3-1 in an English league and solve the problem. The trick is called donkey kick free kick, and it involves one player elevating the ball with a donkey kick and the other striking it toward the net. Great, right? Well, this is what FIFA had to say about using this trick. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Yeah, they banned it. Years after it, when Kevin Nolan attempted this trick from a dead ball situation, the kick was not allowed, given that it was banned years ago. 